guys, how are you? I hope you're all just doing absolutely fantastic. Will, how are you? I'm good. Robert, how are you on this day? How are I you? am I am good. I am fine. Thank you very much. I hope the chat is also doing good. We have a lot of things going on today. We have a very special episode. I sat down with Retro Game Core, who uh, is a, he's a YouTuber who has uh, a channel focused on portable emulators. And you know that I talk a lot about portable emulators. He knows way more about portable emulators. He literally writes guides on them. So he's the guy, he's the authority on it, basically. Uh, but then after that, we're going to talk about the indie world that happened last week. Yes. We're going to talk about uh, friggin' uh, uh, Scuff has a new Xbox controller. Uh, friggin' uh, GTA 3 Vice City and San Andreas may be coming back to the only system that matters. Really? Um, <laughs> yeah. We actually have news to talk about this week. Yes. I just so wanted... if you if you miss, if you enjoyed our um, tier rankings, our unquestionable. <laughs> definitive nothing wrong with them tier rankings sorry to say they're not gonna happen this week well i mean me and retro game core kind of get down to what are the best portable emulators and what makes a good one and what's wrong with all the wow. ones that are out right now so okay that. that's fair uh we don't put them into a tier list although we should have uh i just wanted to come on here and and show face for a minute to show that uh there'll be a regular episode right at the retro game core talk but i don't want to talk yeah. too much because i want to just get right into it i want to let uh him do all the talking so uh we'll see you in a little bit all right well i'm just yep. gonna play the the the, the thing so see you and in i'm gonna seconds. go get a drink there you Bye. go see you hey thanks future bob hey i'm here with uh russ from retro game core how are you doing I'm awesome, man. How you doing? I'm great. This is the first time we're ever speaking to each other. Yeah, it's a little weird. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, outside of like Twitter ads and whatnot, right? Um, yeah. So I want. So obviously, you're you're a YouTuber who works on a lot of uh, portable emulation devices. I describe your channel as you're the guy who like optimizes these things to work best. At least that's my understanding. Is that any, a good way to describe you and your channel? Yeah, I mean, I would honestly say it's mostly I'm just a cheapskate and I don't want to <laughs> buy new things. I want to just like get the most out of the things I already have. So yeah, totally optimizing. So that's one of my biggest problems with uh, these emulation devices. Like I, I love them and I love getting all different ones and seeing how they work. And I, I love trying to chase which one's the best one for me at least. And yeah. my biggest problem is there's always one thing that they get wrong and it's like incredibly aggravating and that's why they come out with a new one like every month or so that's like the new best one yeah, so there's like th tiny incremental updates yeah it's terrible. yeah that's the biggest struggle for me is getting and it's so it's so aggravating that like this is a product that these people sell and it doesn't work right when you get it <laughs> it like takes a little bit of tinkering <laughs> Yeah, it's true. And that's kind of like what I like to do. I like to like think about that perspective. Like, okay, well, what if I can just make a five minute guide that'll fix all their problems and I can never figure it out, you know, because it's always <laughs> way more complicated than that. But that's the goal. So. I, oh, well, no, you do a fantastic job of making it as easy to digest as possible. And that's something I think the emulator space was missing, especially on YouTube. Because, I mean, YouTube tutorials is like a big deal. Uh, that I always yeah. look up stuff on YouTube when I'm trying to figure out how to do stuff. But uh, people like me, I just like to open the box. And if it doesn't work, I'm mad. So right. <laughs> going online and finding a good tutorial, if the tutorial isn't as easy to follow as possible, I'm madder now. So <laughs> your channel is a, a very welcome addition to the, to the you know greater uh, YouTube gaming community. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I just take a beginner's look because I'm I'm new to this too. My channel is still less than a year old. I think in a week it'll be a Damn. year old. And so it's like I'm just just trying it out and just seeing, you know, from that perspective, how things are going and, and how to just make it easier for everyone else. And, I yeah, did not know that. That is less than a year old. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to get this question out on the rip because I know that's what a lot of people are going to be asking. What is the best portable emulator right now? I'm sure you get this question uh, a lot. <laughs> yeah. 
So best and like favorite are totally different, right? I agree. And so yeah, best you can pay, you know, four hundred dollars and get something like the uh, you know, one of the GPD devices, like they have the GPD uh, XD Plus, and that's like an and it's basically a phone that has like buttons on it. You know what I mean? Right. And so a lot of people like that because it's like basically like it's an Android interface. They're comfortable with it. They can put their emulators on there. I don't like that stuff. Like to me, it's it's not an inclusive package, you know. And so I like a lot of the devices that are the RK3326 devices. And I, I've seen you reviewed a few of those, like the RG351V and stuff. Yeah. So my favorite of those is the uh, RGB10 Max. I'll show it here real ooh, quick. Ooh. So this is, uh, it's, it looks like a Switch, right? And so uh, this is the exact same chipset as all those other ones. And it's made by Pow Kitty, who typically has really bad, like, um, just quality overall with hardware and stuff. This one they kind of nailed after screwing it up so many times. <laughs> so it has the same chipset, but it's got a five inch screen. You know, it's uh, it's got the 16 by nine aspect ratio, so it can play a variety of different screen sizes and stuff. And yeah, it's just kind of the best of like all in one, I would say. What is the name of it again? Uh, RGB 10 Max. So they made an RGB 10, which was basically a clone of all the other ones, you know, the Odrego Advance and all that stuff. And then they made just a bigger one. They called it RGB 10 Max. And it's it's got issues. You're going to hate it. Like <laughs> You got to like install a new kernel and stuff and like update brightness because they screw up the brightness when they first uh, updated the kernel and stuff. So there's all these little things you have to do. And I'm still kind of working on an all-inclusive guide on this one. But yeah, it came out maybe, I don't know, three months ago or so. And yeah, I really like it. Okay, so it's relatively new. Uh, yeah. is, this, is this newer than the R3, RG351V? Yeah, was, it came out a little bit after that. Yeah. Okay, because that was my that is my current favorite, I guess. But there's so many like they're all so close. They're they're, they're all yeah. not that different. Uh, but right. but also and that's my I, second favorite, definitely. I feel like we we have a different uh, we have different things we're looking for. Like like you <laughs> you like this, but you did a lot of tinkering to it. It sounds like. Yeah, so like full on, like I love it because I was able to figure out how to get like Super Mario 64, the port running on it at 60 frames per second, which doesn't Ooh. run, you know, the Switch version runs at 30 frames per second. So right. it's it actually looks better than the Switch version. And so the little things like that, I got Shovel Knight working on it, like just those little wow. things that took me a ton of work, but I finally got it running and then I made guides about it or whatever. And so, you know, after these dozens and dozens of hours of work and stuff, now I love it. But at the, t at the time I was like, well, this is... Like the other ones, you know. What what version of Shovel Knight? Uh, Trevor Tro Treasure Trove, the Linux version, full on oh, works, the Linux and it's in widescreen. Okay. Yeah, wow. and so you just grab it off of like GOG or um, Humble Bundle is actually the easiest one to grab, and you can just grab that and port it over. It's it's pretty easy. I got a guide for it. So. Wow. Okay. So yeah. I noticed N sixty four emulation is like really hard to get right on these things. So how yeah. how did this how did you how were you able to get n64 to run good on this thing so it it doesn't only mario okay. 64 works <laughs> mario so, 64 seems it, to run okay on like on like most of them yeah so the whole thing you know there was like that big leak of mario 64 a couple years back and then like right. people basically they decompiled and recompiled the whole source code for that and so because of that you use the, you basically extract the code from the emulator from the rom itself and then you plug it into this database thing, and then it makes a port that's natively going to work on the device. Whereas everything else, oh. you're trying to emulate a Nintendo 64, which requires a lot more CPU than what these things have. And so that's why regular Nintendo 64 games don't work very well, but this one does because it's basically playing it natively on the device. So, so is this? A, so you basically compiled a Linux version of, of Mario 64? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, somebody else did it, but I made a guy. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. That's and so awesome. there's people. Yeah, so people are working on an Ocarina of Time decompilation. Same exact same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're like 90% done. They're probably going to be done by the end of this calendar year. And so I would expect early next year, there's going to be native versions of Ocarina of Time working on this. Oh, thing. don't make me play that game again. I'm, <laughs> I'm playing through it for the first time now. And I've, oh, really? I've, uh, I've, I've notoriously been like a, like a hater on Ocarina of Time. <laughs> But because like I was like yeah. nine when it came out and I was like, I don't know what to do or where to go. This game's stupid. I'm bringing it back to Blockbuster. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, no, I haven't gotten I haven't even heard of this one. I haven't gotten uh, a chance to take a look at it. So, yeah, I guess. I'll yeah, it's pretty to. good. I mean, 
if you have the RG351P or the M, it's like the exact same form factor and everything. It's just a little bit bigger, really. And Ambernick has been talking about maybe doing one like this too, but they're probably going to upgrade the chipset, so it's not going to be out for probably another few months, I would say. So that's that's a good question. Uh, there are a lot of different companies that make these sort of things. Uh, and yeah. like I know Powkitty and, and Ambernick, uh, they pretty much make the same things with like small incremental upgrades but then there's like Odroid, droid and i get a lot of comments that are like uh uh, this is just an Odroid, droid but reskinned or or or, you know this that or the other thing so are there different like uh i guess like like uh uh, category trees of these devices like is there an Odroid droid tree and like like a like an ambernick tree and like a palkity tree or is there like a chip set that everybody uses like how does it work with these devices yeah yeah, so Hard Kernel is the name of the company that makes the Odroid devices, and they're a Korean company. And they're like the innovators. Like, they're the ones who take and make, like, the the single board computer. Like, they, they make the chipset, not the chipset, but, you know, they make the board and they put it all together. And then their devices, you know, they come out and they're kind of crappy. Like, hardware-wise, they're not very good. So then the Chinese companies, Ambernick, Palkitty, you know, stuff like that, they, st- they basically just steal that. And then they make their own version of it, and then they, they create it with better hardware. And so Odroid starts it, and so the Odroid Go Advance, for example, is the one that the 351P is modeled after, and then as, as well as even the RGB 10 Max. And then Hard Kernel made another one called the Odroid Go Super, which is a 5-inch device, which is this guy here. And so this is almost exactly like that, but it's kind of crappy. Like, it has, <laughs> it has really bad analog sticks and stuff like that. And so... The RGB 10 Max is like an improvement of that. And so, yeah, it, it, for at least the last year or two, it's been hard kernel making the innovations, the Chinese companies ripping it off and making all the money, basically. So, so, so is just the build quality bad or is it is it the chipset is bad and everything? Yeah, well, it's it's kind of, it's not the chipset. It's really their uh, their approach to things. So they're, hard kernel is a developer's company. So they make these things for tinkerers, like people who are interested in just kind of figuring out what they can do with it. So they don't even ship an SD card or any of the firmware on it at all. They expect you to know how to do all that stuff. And so things like buttons and D-pads and stuff, it's an afterthought to them. And it makes sense because they don't really care about that aspect. They're They're more interested in what the community will do with it. And it's the opposite for the Chinese companies. They're trying to make something they can just sell, and it works mm. really well, you know. So would you say that Odroid, uh, do, do they have good uh, software? Is it optimized when it comes out, or is it just they expect you to, to make it better? So so Odroid doesn't do anything. Like The, the one nice thing about it is Emulec, which is like the firmware that a lot of people use. You know, It's like the one that looks like Emulation Station. So right. the developer of Emulec supports Odroid. And so he makes these firmwares for Odroid specifically. And then, then you know, the Chinese companies rip that off. And so a lot of the custom firmwares and stuff are people who take that Chinese ripped off version of Emulec and make their own version. They fork it and they make their own stuff. And that's where you get things like Arco West or 351 Elect, which are these like custom firmwares made by typically people in the West who who know a little bit more about programming and stuff. And so it's this weird cycle, right? Where Odroid makes these innovations, they get the developers who help them out because they they really like the company because they're you know innovative and stuff. And then Chinese rip them off, and then Americans or, or other people will fix it afterwards. So kind of so, so uh, I mean I i don't I, like i get a lot of these different sorts of devices but i feel like they're all like ambernick or 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 i mean i get a couple of pow kitties but but they're all pretty much yeah. very they all seem similar when i'm holding them in my hand and i'm playing the game but they all have different uis and and mm-hmm. maybe some are android and, so, and some are linux based and yeah. and they have different emulators inside of them that run all the different games and I'm always frustrated by how poorly optimized they are when I get them in my hands. So what is happening from the point when they steal Odroid's like ideas and making yeah. it their own? Why has it? Why have they still not been able to uh, get these things to run good on their own? Yeah. So part of it, I think it's kind of an afterthought to them too, the software side of things. So for example, 
the firmware that ships with like the RG351P and the M and the V and all that, it's all based on the same MUELEC code. And all they did with it is basically adjusted it for the screen uh, dimensions and then like configured it for the specific button so that each of the inputs worked. And then they throw, the, like it's really lazy as them. They, they just throw a bunch of ROMs on there and they're always like poorly translated. Like they'll throw in the European <laughs> yeah. ROMs. So they're running at 50 Hertz instead of, you know, at the 60. And so things like that, cause they don't know any better, right? Or they'll throw in the Chinese version. You'll, you'll pull up Chrono Trigger be like oh sweet chrono tree is on here in japanese and it's like i can't play this yeah. game and so all these the, like it's just kind of what i think it is is they don't put a lot of investment in that software team and you know they don't hire like americans or you know english speakers or anything else like that so they're just trying to kind of work, work with their way through it and then i think at some point they just rely on the uh the developers here in the community to make things so for example that pocket go uh firmware that you got right you got that firmware and then you made a whole video about how to upgrade it based on my guide and stuff mm -hmm. well all they did is they just stole my guide and then they just started loading that <laughs> onto their sd cards so now if you buy it today it comes with the upgraded firmware and they didn't ask me or anything they just grabbed it off my website wait so wait I remember I did I def that definitely happened. Uh, I don't yeah. remember if they sent me your video or if they, they did. Yeah. did. But did they do that before or after I had made the video already? <laughs> they sent it before you made the video. So okay. they sent me an, a preliminary copy of it, and I said, "Well, let me see what I can do with it." And so I messed around with it. And I'm not a developer; like I literally just messed around, like in the SD card, and and just messed with the numbers and got it working right. And so then I told them, I said, hey, I fixed it and here's the guide I made and stuff. And then they sent it to like you and a couple of the other YouTubers and stuff said, hey, can you fix our software? Here's how to do it. And Wait, nowadays what, they just ship it. With what device was this again? The S30, the one that looks like a Super Nintendo controller. Like this right. Thing. That thing was yeah, yeah. awful out of the box. <laughs> yeah, that thing was right. was rough. And yeah, I remember that was like the most work I've ever done on one of these things was was that guy. And uh, yeah, your yeah. guide was incredibly helpful. It was very easy, and it runs <laughs> awesome after that. But uh, it's still not, you know, as good yeah. as some of the other stuff that we've gotten since then. Thanks. Yeah, I was totally. I watched your stream mm. when you were doing it, and I was just cringing. I was like, "Oh my god, <laughs> if he messes this up." Because to be honest, right? I mean, you're the kind of guy that if something's bullcrap, like you say it. Like this yeah. thing sucks, right? <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh my god, he's gonna say that my guides suck," and I'm just like waiting for it, and you didn't. So I it's. Won, but I, I know. I mean. I feel like it'd be very rare for me to shit on a guide because like uh, un unless you're like leaving stuff out and like skipping ahead or whatever mm. but like I know that I'm the problem when it comes to like following <laughs> along with it I mean I know that the device number one device is the problem things shouldn't be like that fuck this thing yeah. but <laughs> when I'm following along with a with a with a guide I know that I'm the second problem <laughs> as if the guide's good, <laughs> it's probably my fault that I'm messing things up, uh, but no, you know, it, it's, it's a testament to how good the guide was because I was able to figure it out while also yeah. streaming on Twitch. So, yeah, uh, which is amazing. Yeah. There was a lot of hurdles there. W what made you start making videos or I guess, I guess, well, you talked about this before that uh, that uh, you watched my video on on the um, original Pocket Go. Yeah, the but, original Pocket Go. Yeah. So, what made you start making videos, though? Because that, that's what made you buy yeah. your first portable emulator, which I think is right. freaking awesome. But what made you start making yeah. videos on it? So that was so I bought it two years ago, and I t mm -hmm. tinkered around with it for a little bit, but I, I really didn't know what I was doing, and I, I gave up on the thing. I was like, you know what? Put it. I actually gave it to my wife. I said, hey, throw this in your purse. I put Dr. Mario on it. And I was like, here, you can just play Dr. Mario on it. And that was it, you know, and then the pandemic happened. And so uh, my work, I, I, so I'm in the military, I'm in the Navy, and they sent a bunch of us home. They just said work from home for a while. And so I didn't realize it was going to last seven months. I was home for like half a year, you know, and so I got super bored and uh, I ended up watching more YouTube videos like everybody else at the time. And then I saw some other video about at the time, I think it was the Retroid Pocket 2 was coming out and then the RG350 was out. And so I was like... I'm just going to buy one of these things. And so I bought one and then I had the time to really like tinker around and mess with it and look at guides. And I realized that the guides out there were just all over the place. Like you mentioned before, yeah. there was no like clear, clear voice, you know? And I was like, there's a, there's an option here, an opportunity for me to make a website. And then, and then and eventually I started making YouTube videos too, because it just seemed to be an easier form factor. And yeah, that's just kind of how it went. And then just kept going and 
Like, look at me now. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like making a website is uh, is an obvious choice. And, like, it, it makes sense for something like this because having a written guide is really cool. Um, right. But uh, there's no discoverability. Like, how are you going to tell people, like, hey, this is the guide? I guess you got to, yeah. like, get some uh, some SEO so that when people Google it, you're the first one that pops up or whatever. But right. Uh, right. YouTube's got the discoverability. And like I said before, especially with, like, how-to stuff, uh that's the first thing I go to is YouTube when I want to learn how to do something. So, yeah, uh, it was the per I think it was the perfect mix f for you. Um, yeah, and that's another. Yeah, and thing. I really helped out. Go ahead. Oh, no, go you you go ahead. I was just going to say that. Uh, so I have a background in this kind of stuff in media and things like that. And uh, I did a recent like face reveal on my my channel. But I I'm a cookbook author, so I started a food blog like ten years ago, and it got picked up by a publisher. And so I ended up publishing three books. One of them even Ooh. was a New York Times bestseller. And so wow. I did all my photography and stuff at that time. And so I'm really comfortable with a camera. And, and so it just was an easy transition. I'd never done video before. So that was like a new thing for me. But, you know, the whole blogging and writing and making guides, it's very similar to like writing a recipe. And so right. uh, it just kind of flowed naturally for me. And I was like, oh, I'll just keep going then. And I really liked the idea of video because it was challenging. It was something I'd never done before. A lot of people uh, think to themselves, like, 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 if, if when people have the opportunity to like start a YouTube channel or or make their own mm -hmm. thing in like this space, uh, a lot of times they think to themselves, uh, "Oh, there's people who know more about this than me. I, I'm, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not worthy of like talking about it, or, or uh, I don't have the skill set to to make a video right. or whatever." But really. Um, you know more about the stuff than you might think that you do. And there's definitely way more people that know way less about it than you do and are, <laughs> and are willing to listen. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, nobody's perfect. You're never going to be the absolute authority on anything, but if you see yeah. a need in the space, I mean, there's definitely, uh, people are going to watch and, and, and like I said, uh, retro game core fills like a, like a void in, in this space that definitely needed filling. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's funny. Like I sometimes people will jump on comments and stuff and they'll just like rip me a new one. Like they've been in the emulation <laughs> scene for 15 years, right? Yep. And they'd be like, oh, you forgot all these things. And I'm like, well, now I just learned it. So thanks. And so <laughs> I just kind of learn as I go, you know, but I totally get that. But the lowest common denominator, like that's who I try to appeal to is like, hey, let's all like get a little bit smarter together, you know? Right. See, see, for for my videos, I get frustrated if it's not perfect out of the box or whatever. So uh I always get comments of like, all you have to do is plug a thumb drive into the side and then run this script and then you got all your games on there. What's so hard to know about that? And it's like, I'm not doing any of that. And neither is anybody right. else who's watching this. So yeah, uh, yeah. yeah there's again, there's always going to be people who know more and always going to be people. But, but like, you know, you, you're never going to be able to, in the time it takes you to make a YouTube video, you're never going to be able to like cover all bases. Uh, right. unless, unless you release like one video every two months and spend all of your time on that one thing. <laughs> Um, yeah, I have a, exactly. I have a question. You said that you you're in the Navy, and you worked from mm -hmm. home for seven months. How does yeah. one work at the <laughs> Navy from home? <laughs> so I'm a translator. So that's my job oh, in the Navy. Okay. And so, but you know, at this point, actually, I'm 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 I, you know, I've been in for 21 years at this point, and my rank actually is you'll find this funny is a Master Chief. So I'm a real life Master Chief. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> Yeah. And so it's mostly leadership and it's amazing, you know, because everyone else went home too, but you know, all the administrative and leadership things, you know, we ended up figuring out how to do it via like Microsoft Teams and all this other stuff. And so we, we kept it going, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not attached to a ship right now or anything else like that. So the guys on the ships, they had to just basically stay out to sea, which really sucked for them. Uh, but I, I got it easy. So I was able to go home for a bit. Nice. What, what languages are, are you translating? Uh, so so I originally learned Russian. That was uh, when we have like a language school in California. It's pretty crazy. They just throw you in for like a year and just make you learn a language. And so I did Russian init initially. And then uh, I also speak Indonesian, which I learned along the way as wow. well. So, it so my it, two. Yeah. They, they throw you in a school for a year and they basically just like force you to only speak that language. Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. All day, every day. It's all you do. And uh, it works. You know, you come out of there and you're you're usually at the level of somebody who has a master's degree in that language and it's wow in so, so i i used to take italian and my mom's from italy and she speaks mm -hmm. italian uh but she never taught me and i took italian in school and i was horrible at it 
to the point where my Italian teacher asked my parents if I was in like the more remedial classes or whatever, because I was so bad at it. Um, and then I tried it again in college because I had to, and I once again did terrible at it. Um, uh. So I was never a language learning guy, but now I'm trying to learn Japanese and it's, mm. and it's, it's not, <laughs> it's not going that good. So that's a beast. I mean, that's the, so we have like categories of how hard a language mm. is and Japanese is in the hardest one for English speakers to learn. And so Japanese, Korean, Arabic, uh, what's the one I'm missing? Chinese Mandarin. So those are the hardest. I hear that out of the Asian languages that Korean is the easiest. Is that true? Or am I it, wrong with that? It can be, right? Because it has a script, so you can actually just mm. read it. It doesn't have characters. It does have characters, but not, you know, typically they use a script. And so that makes it easier. But then also the thing that makes Korean hard is the grammar. Like the grammar in Korean is out of this world. And they they don't talk very directly. And so you have to do a lot of, you know, insinuation and stuff. And so that's what makes it really complicated. So when you learned Indonesian, uh, did you do the same thing where for a year you went to a school and only spoke that? Yeah, it was less than that. It was about four or five months, actually. So mm. Indonesian is an easier language because it's meant to be understood. You know, you can imagine Indonesia used to be what we refer to as the Spice Islands back in the day. Right. And so they're a, a company that's or a company, other country that's always been related to like markets and like trade and stuff like that. And so their language is very easy. It's kind of market based. And so uh, grammar is actually very similar to Spanish. And so it was actually very easy too. they they you know, they put their adjectives after the word and stuff like that. And so it, it is a pretty easy language to learn. So. Well, one of the hardest parts for Japanese for me is figuring out the structure of the sentence because everything's backwards or like yeah. some of the things yeah. are backwards. And it's 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 a whole it's I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, having, I'm having a rough go, but I'm sticking with it because I'm mad that I didn't start doing it earlier. Yeah. So my wife's Japanese. She she oh. you know she lives here in Hawaii and grew up here. And uh, but she went through Japanese class all through grade school and, and you know high school and stuff like that too. But she still she's not a language person. She's not good either. So it's all good. <laughs> she does like uh, you know the uh, Duolingo every night, and I just see her and I'm like, man, you should be better than this. <laughs> see, I don't even do that. I, I'm I'm bad at. Uh, uh... Uh, doing things myself so I, I like have somebody who's yeah. like trying to teach me so i should be doing okay. stuff like you know the language learning apps every night but i'm just i'm i i never did homework in school i'm freaking 31 i'm not starting now <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's all good yeah i'll just learn in the field uh anyway right. uh we were talking about <laughs> emulators <laughs> somehow we got off about language learning um it's all good what was the last thing i asked you uh oh yeah you started how you started the youtube channel yeah uh yeah so do you have any particular videos that you're uh most proud of i get this yeah question you know it's it's sure um so my my favorite actually is the one where I cracked that the S30 device, this one here. Like when mm -hmm. I made that firmware, it was the first time that I had created something. Like I I take other people's work and I put it together and compile it and I make it easier to digest and stuff. But that was the first time where it was me. Like I remember at home and I like kind of had a breakthrough. My wife was like, "Hey, dinner's ready." I'm like, "All right." And I get out there and I like tell everyone, "I'm like, man, I think I just made something," you know. <laughs> And so I made a video about that, and that that was really exciting to me uh, for the first time where I actually broke through. It's probably not like the best video to watch nowadays, but uh, I'm really proud of that one. <laughs> Did that so like whenever people ask me like what my favorite video yeah. of mine is, it's almost always a video that did really bad. <laughs> or like isn't like a popular video yeah. so did that video do particularly well for you because i mean you did you were breaking through on that one device yeah so you i think you and a couple other people like linked to it and so that mm -hmm. did help it but it's still it's nothing close to like in my top <laughs> 30 of the videos i've done you know and there's another one i did for april fool's day uh, you know i always review these devices i talk about how they feel and all this stuff so i did a review of my cat because my cat shows up in like a lot of my videos and so i just reviewed my cat like it was a device and i'm like oh you know it's got good tactile feedback and blah 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 it's speakers loud all these kind of things right <laughs> And I did it on April's Fools, and it's got like zero views. Nobody watches it. It's kind of funny, but I love that one too. Yeah, it's, I hate how that's the way YouTube works. Yeah, you put okay. a lot of time into something, and and you really put a lot of passion behind it, and it just absolutely tanks. Yeah. So that's the one I share with people, and they're like, "Oh, you have a YouTube channel?" I'm like, "Yeah, check this one out." And it's like me reviewing a cat. So, uh, what 
here's another question I want to know. What do you think that these companies can do about these portable emulators to make them uh, 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 better? Or at least, you know, like when we get them in our hands, they're like good. Yeah. So number one thing is they need to involve the community like ahead of time. Like they do this, they got, you know, one thing to note, right, is that we are like 10% of their audience, if that, right? They're selling these devices in China. That, that That's their whole goal, right? Because that's where all their sales are. And so we're an afterthought when it comes to that kind of perspective. But if they just gave it to us a month ahead of time and just delayed the release for a little bit and let us give feedback and that kind of thing, I think they would be able to ship just a much better version. Obviously, we can't like send back like ROMs and stuff. They're going to have to do that shady stuff on their own. But we could at least make the firmware for it, you know, and and they never do. They just ship it to us. And then, you know, three months later, we have a firmware that works for it. And it's just a pain in the butt. So, so you're saying they need some sort of uh, uh, a better quality assurance and, and your solution is to involve the community, which I think makes perfect yeah. sense. That That's right. Kind yeah, of I think what, they just give us a lead time. That's kind of what is that what Valve's trying to do with the Steam Deck? I think so. You know, they, they gave everyone hands on and they announced it really well ahead of time. And I think people if you watch, there's YouTube videos of people who are creating like CPU, like they're creating computers, PCs that are modeled after the specs that they have already and then seeing wow. what it can do and what they can do with it, right? Like there's people who are so into that. And I, I am too. I just really want to get one first. And so, uh, yeah, I think that's exactly what Valve did. And they announced it three months ahead of time. And they're a known commodity, you know, and it gives even the developers, like the game makers, time to adjust it for the new operating system and stuff too. They already have a developer's page up that says, hey, these are the things you can do right now to prepare your games for when this thing launches. So they're already all over. It's awesome. So what's your what what's your take on the Steam Deck? Like when it releases, how how uh, successful do you think it's going to be, and how good do you think it's going to be for uh, typical users like the layman and for yeah. for emulation? I think for PC gaming, like I I'm not a PC gamer, so I don't really understand a lot of that very well. But it seems to be fine. You know, I think that if you wanted to play your PC games, you know, at 720p, I think it'd be okay for the most part. But the emulation thing is super exciting. And I did a video about it too, because, because it has that SD card slot. You could load, just like you do with any of these other devices, you could load a firmware onto that, throw all the games onto it too, and then just tell it to boot into the SD card instead of the regular hard drive. Oh. And at that point, you you have the opportunity to basically create your own gaming system that's like irregardless of whatever's going on with the actual uh, device itself. So you're not messing with the firmware it's itself, like the Steam operating system. You're not messing with the games you have in there. You basically just have a whole like emulation device on an SD card. You plug it in and you can play everything. And so based on, you know, you're probably going to be limited by the SD card speeds, but I think that based on the chipset and what I've read so far, you're going to at least be emu be able to emulate all the way up through PS2, Wii U, GameCube, uh, and potentially some Switch games, and maybe even a little bit of PS3 so, so, from the so, SD card. So are you saying that you put the games on the SD card? Are you saying you put a whole other operating system on the SD card? You put all of it. So you would put the firmware and you would load the games, just like how if you take like the RG351V and you took out that first SD card, it wouldn't mm -hmm. know what to do, right? It needs the SD card for the firmware and the games. You can do that exact same thing. There's a there's a software. It's not Emulec, but it's similar. It's called Botocera, and it's it's made for this kind of thing where you can actually install it onto an external hard drive or onto an SD card or a flash drive, and then you just plug it into your computer or whatever you want to do, and it'll just load that instead. And you put all the games and everything else on that too. And I made I made a video about this maybe about two weeks ago where I took this little uh, flash drive, which is a 500 gig flash drive, 50 bucks. And I loaded it up, everything up through PS3, Xbox, like the original Xbox, Wii U, all that stuff, and then plugged it into my PC, booted it into that, and then just played my games without having to install anything actually on the PC. Wow. So what's the UI like on something yeah. like that? It's the same UI as like any of these other ones. Like it's like the emulation station interface. So you can oh, download okay. your themes, customize it. You would pick your system, pick your game. Same kind of thing as the RG351V or something like that. Wow. So I'm I'm working on mm. uh uh getting like an arcade cabinet situation set up for the, mm. to, you know just like an emulator arcade cabinet with like every thing yeah. on it. And part of it it already has a Raspberry Pi in it. I got it for, mm. uh, through like some micro center deal. Like it's an Atari arcade yeah. cabinet that came with uh, that stuff. Um and I'm considering instead of using the Raspberry Pi using a PC. So this sounds like a really good idea to just have like a tiny little PC with yep. that on it because then it's just emulation station 
Yeah, let me show you. I've I've been playing around with this mini PC. So this thing here is like a two hundred dollar PC, and it has wow. a Celeron chip on it. But you plug the SD card or an external hard drive into it, and this thing can play. It can't play PS2, but it can play GameCube just fine and PSP upscaled to like ten eighty p and all that stuff. And this thing's like a two hundred dollar PC on Amazon. Wow. And and is that yeah. what you have? You have the little memory card plugged into it, or or I'm whatever using an external hard drive. Yeah, just use an external hard drive, like a two terabyte drive. It's just full of games and stuff. I'm going to do a video on it here soon. But yeah, it's like you just put everything on the hard drive and then that hard drive can go wherever you want. It doesn't matter what PC you plug it into. As long as it's just a Windows PC, it'll work fine. So that changes a lot about what I think about the Steam Deck, because being able to just <laughs> plug in an SD card and taking it out if you want to just play the Steam Deck stuff. So you have yep. an emulation machine and you have the regular old Steam Deck on yeah, yeah, it's basically like having two separate devices. That's pretty awesome. I, I, right. I've and the been... thing is so limited by a hard drive space that you're like, yeah. I don't want to mess with the, the hard drive space you have. I want to add my own, you know. So, so I've been seeing like when it was announced, I saw a lot of rumblings on Twitter talking about how uh, it has SD card space, but uh, it might not be fast enough to play the games that people want to play. Uh, I know I think it was Review Tech who was like on Twitter, like going crazy about that stuff. Um, yeah. but the switch plays everything off of the SD card. And, right. uh, I think in IGN's review or, or their hands on for the steam deck, I think they were running everything off of the S uh, the micro SD card. So it looks like it'll right. probably be fine. And that was another concern for me because, uh, the $400 steam deck has like no storage and right. calling it like a $400, like switch alternative or, or $400 uh, mobile PC is like kind of misleading if it's only got 64 gigabytes. Uh, so you right. have to buy the better version. But if you can get whatever SD card you want in there, then that's a pretty big game changer. Yeah, you got to remember that file transfer speeds for emulators and stuff like that, like, you know, all the way up through PS2, like it, it was super slow. They didn't like an SD card is already a faster transfer speed than anything that you can expect on any of those devices. And so that's not an issue when it comes to emulation at all. I can see for AAA games, if you're going to play a PC game off an SD card, you're going to have issues when it comes to like loading times and stuff, but otherwise it's going to be fine. Yeah, and and I think a lot of PC games right now, they're optimized for like uh, all different types of PCs and like, you know, crappy PCs and good PCs and stuff. Right. I mean, certain games like Cyberpunk, you're going to need a pretty beefy PC, but uh, like Doom right. can run great on lower powered PCs. Uh, my whole concern for the Steam Deck was always about how it's, uh, I mean, it's it, people yell at me that it's not emulation, <laughs> but it's like, mm. it's, it's, it's basically emulating, uh, uh, these windows <laughs> games on, on, uh, on, on yeah. Linux. So that was always like, I mean, it can't run everything great. There's going to be some problems and uh, we won't know right. until we get the thing in our hands. Um, yeah. but at least it's give you an pretty... example. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So give me an example. Uh, so when I made that little flash drive, I put the original Halo on there, the Xbox version, right? Plugged it into my PC. And you, if you remember back in the day, that loading screen, it would be like that white light that would go across the screen. And sometimes it would take like five minutes to go across. It does it in like two seconds. It just like, zoop, <laughs> and then you're in the game, you know? And so the speeds are much faster than people are thinking, especially right. when it comes to emulation. Yeah, for, for emulating uh, retro stuff, I feel like this thing's going to be a freaking tank. I mean, this, this thing's... Yeah. Powerful enough to play the newest AAA stuff on PC at low settings. So being able to play, yeah. you know, stuff up to PS2, I feel like would be absolutely no problem for this thing. Yep, exactly. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, but we won't know until December when this thing comes out. Right. They, they, well, I won't know until like March because I got a later. Like it took me 15 minutes to make my pre-order, and so oh, I got to wait till like March. No. Oh no! Well. I was uh, <laughs> I, I, I was taking my Japanese class the sec the the oh. the out the second that the pre-orders went live is when my class started and i was like hey i gotta you gotta give me like two seconds i gotta yeah <laughs> i gotta refresh this page a billion times right um yeah so uh oh i'm, I'm glad you were able to at least get the the, the steam deck pre-order yeah there's, a, yeah, there's totally. a lot of people who are, who are still waiting on that um oh so they also said that uh i saw a gumitsu article i was talking about how they were uh that valve was talking about opening up the steam deck software to uh other uh manufacturers to potentially make their own sort of steam decks yeah uh and they did that with uh the valve uh with the with the steam pcs and that kind of made things a, a lot more confusing so 
I guess if they uh, don't get this right with the hardware, there's potential for other companies to swoop in, but I don't know how much better of a job anybody else could do. Right. Yeah. So I'm worried about that side of things. I do think it'd be cool, you know, if people can improve it, maybe make it a little smaller or something. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the, the Panasonic 3DO did the same thing back in the 90s, right, where they they allowed people to create their own devices using the same architecture. And it was a nightmare like that. That console did so poorly. And there was a lot of reasons for it. But that's one of them is that it was so confusing which one you're supposed to buy the Philips one or whatever. You know what I mean? It was just too much. So. I actually didn't know that about the 3DO. I always thought it was just the Yeah, there's so many different board. versions of it. Yeah, there was even there's a video I watched recently where somebody basically were talking about how they made one for like adult entertainment. So it was basically like a way <laughs> of playing video game porn. And it was modeled and, and marketed for that specifically. And it's the same thing. They had the, you know, the ability to release it and license it and all that other kind of stuff. But that will super definitely confusing. kill a console. Especially one right. like like back then these games were aimed at kids and making a console. Yeah. It basically it make having your console open like that and having somebody make it for specifically adult entertainment will absolutely kill the market for that console yeah <laughs> except, except yeah. which is contrary to everything else porn usually r runs the industry when they're right. like we're gonna go with blu-ray and then everybody went with blu-ray yeah. uh, but i guess sure. that's a little different yeah well it sold a lot of night trap back in the day i think people were really interested in that on the sega cd so yes oh. that that is that is a good point well the sega was like that was like the cool like like badass console back then right yeah they had blood and mortal Kombat. it was crazy <laughs> what consoles did you grow up with uh so i grew up uh so I'm, I'm about 10 years older than you so i grew up with the nes like that's what i had through grade school and stuff and then we didn't go super nintendo because it was more expensive than the genesis so we got the genesis oh. Uh, and then Sega CD and 32X. And then at that point, I basically got out of video games. I discovered girls at that point. But before that, yeah, that's all I had. So. I had the same trajectory, except I just, I guess I just never discovered girls. <laughs> yeah. yeah so I've... for me, like PlayStation, Nintendo 64, those are all enigmas to me. I never played any of those games. Wow. So it's all brand new when I'm playing around with it. And that part of that joy of discovery in my videos is like me playing a Dreamcast game for the first time. I'm like, this is amazing. I never knew about this. <laughs> So what made you want to get that uh, that uh, original portable emulator that you got? Is it have you, were you never yeah. did you was that the first time you're going back into gaming since the friggin 90s? No, you know, I got like the I had the Xbox 360 like everybody else, you know, and then I had like a PS4 and stuff. So I had modern games, but there was still that gap. And honestly, I never bought them to play Nintendo 64 because it, the interest wasn't really there. I just wanted to play like Mario 3 again on the go. Like that's all <laughs> I really wanted to do. And I'm an Apple user. And so I couldn't get it on a phone because it's so freaking difficult. Yeah. And so, yeah, I was like, this is probably the best solution. That's a that's a good point. Um, w w so what? When you're testing out all these little portable emulators, what uh, games do you play to try out the different uh, emulators that are on there? Because I always have a certain set of games that I try to see how yeah. everything runs. Yeah, so I do Mario 3 for uh, just to figure out whether or not the, there's any input lag and stuff. And I have a running joke on my channel where I don't acknowledge that that game exists. I just say, oh, and here's a random game. Let me try this one out. I've never heard of it. And I like I do that every time. And so I play Mario 3 every time. And then I also do Mario World because that's also a good indicator of input lag. And then uh, Mega Man X is a good indicator for uh, scaling. So whether or not the pixels are distorted because the life bar is like those little dots. like, And so you can see immediately if it's having issues who's rendering the pixels ah. and i kind of go on from there you know nintendo 64 i'll do f0 because that one you can tell speed you know whether or not there's any slowdown and same thing with like psp i'll do ridge racer because that's another one i can tell immediately if there's slowdown so interesting so that, that sounds like a very technical reason for these certain games yeah, and it also has to do with how quickly the game will boot. Because, yes. for example, I'd love to play like Okami on the PS2, but that thing has like a 25 minute long cutscene that you can't skip before you actually start playing. And so I never show that game off because I don't have the patience to sit through that. So. Yeah, it's another problem for me is well, you you got the camera set up, you're filming, and then you have like 20 minutes of wasted footage trying to get through a cutscene. I like yeah. I like Mega Man Zero on the Game Boy Advance to try that, and uh, that yeah. has like a ten minute long cutscene at the beginning that you have to right. mash through, and it's super annoying. But some of these emulators have fast forward, which is great. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's another thing. I mean, most of them, any of them that runs like RetroArch in the background, you can just full on put on fast forward and stuff. A lot of times, you got to configure it first, but yeah, it's there. Right. 
Uh, the other ones I try, I do try Mega Man X, but only because I know that game well and I, I'm able mm. to tell. But a lot of the times, if they put it on, it's the it's the European version that's 50 right. frames per second, so it yeah. already is slower and that. and it feels weird. Um, yeah. Uh, I also always I, in my videos I always see I always say, is this one gonna pass the Yoshi's Island test? Because Yoshi's Island has uh. that Super FX two chip or something, and it yep. runs. Uh, sometimes it runs absolutely horribly on certain some some emul some of these devices will play Super Nintendo games great, and then you load mm. up uh, Yoshi's Island and it just chugs. It just can't right. do it. Yeah, that and Star Fox. Uh, I'll try those too if I'm if I'm worried about whether or not Super Nintendo will play fine. Then I yeah, those are the two I test. So yeah, yeah, and, and for N sixty four, I. I mean, Mario usually runs good, but I try that off the rip because I know that one the best. And uh, then I'll do Perfect Dark for some reason. <laughs> oh, Perfect really? Dark seems. Actually, so... I've never played that. Perfect Perfect Dark, I think, is the better Goldeneye because, like, by then they uh, like they figured out a lot. I mean, Goldeneye's got the freaking yeah. name recognition, but uh, right. Perfect Dark is basically this Goldeneye two. Um, yeah. But I that might use the uh what's it called the the expansion pack I I don't, I don't remember but I I yeah, know that some emulators awesome. have a hard time running it. Yeah, for for me, uh, I cannot get over the controls for Goldeneye and Perfect Dark. Like they are just so unintuitive to me, and I can't figure out what setting to make it work and stuff. Because I never grew up playing any of those, and so for me, I, I the moment I touch Goldeneye, I hate it. I'm like, this game yeah. sucks so bad. So that. I have a really old video where I talk about the history of uh, modern video game control schemes, which I was obsessed oh, right. with for a while, but nobody else cared. <laughs> it was like my <laughs> own little, like, I was like Charlie from It's Always Sunny with the freaking Pepe Silva map in the background. But <laughs> um, basically, Halo figured out control schemes for, for yeah. modern first-person shooters. So going back before that and playing shooters feels like like you know it it feels terrible and golden eye yeah. uh so so you know you you got the one stick for movement it, it, in modern first person shoes you got one stick for movement and one stick for aiming but right. golden eye took the i think horizontal axis and flipped it on both sticks yeah so so y you want to try to aim but you're really rotating the character it it's it <laughs> it breaks your brain a little bit um yeah and i think it might be inverted or maybe it's not inverted something about it like makes it really messes with people's heads that however yeah. there is a control scheme in goldeneye that oh, is really? most similar to modern controls but in order to get but it oh, requires it requires two n64 controllers <laughs> so you plug two n64 controllers in and you have to swap your hands left to right and it is oh a twin stick shooter all of a sudden. Like, well, like, you know, oh it's like gosh. a modern twin stick game. And it works right. really well. And it might, you might be able to do it, but you definitely yeah. will have a really hard time getting it, getting one of the portable emulators to do that. Right. Yeah. I think I've seen a video where somebody took those two controllers and like welded them together to make <laughs> one big controller. It's, it's got like three sticks sticking out of it. That's, that's a good idea. Uh, some of yeah. these controller, I mean, some of these portable emulators have a setting where um, you can uh, you map the uh, the trigger, one of the triggers mm -hmm. to. Uh, so some of these things have like have like a left stick. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. The, like the RG three fifty one V that yeah. has uh, the left stick but no right stick, but you can you right. can map it so that you hold down on one of the triggers and it turns the face buttons into a C stick and. Right. If you can wrap your head around it and play it for like a minute or two, you can kind of yeah. figure it out and it's not so bad playing like Perfect Dark or Goldeneye. But right. if you're if you're used yeah, to Halo thing, or something, it's gonna be a problem. Right. Another thing you can do, like for PSP games, they're notorious for it, where you know, I had one little nub, right? But then it had the L and R buttons. And so what they do is they they mapped the camera like shifting to the LNR. And so what you can do with these emulators, if they have two analog sticks, you can then map the buttons to the right analog stick so all of a sudden you're playing a game and it actually works perfectly the way that you would expect <laughs> it to for like a platformer like ratchet and clank or something like that yeah it's kind of cool that's that's pretty awesome that's a that's a weird sort yeah. of retrofitting like modern controls into like old games yeah yeah they, uh it, that's another problem with a lot of these devices is like 
you have to make a device that has the buttons that are capable of playing everything before Dreamcast. <laughs> right. And they all have such wildly yeah. different controllers. Yeah, it's true. I mean, you, you just have your typical setup now where they, they're doing the L1 and L2 and R1, R2, and then the clickable thumbsticks and stuff like that. And But it's hard to, like, for example, you know, if you were to have one that emulates GameCube, the GameCube layout doesn't really match a lot of that stuff. And so it yeah. ends up feeling very unintuitive because that was a system that I played a little bit of back in the early 2000s with the GameCube. And I can't still wrap my head around how to play some games. Yeah, Nintendo they were always like uh they were never afraid to be weird with it and uh yeah they were innovative in some ways like the the, the super nintendo controller like is is what paved the way for a lot of things after that and then nintendo was like right. now nah, we're smarter than that we don't need to stick with this we'll f figure something else out and then they went with the freaking n64 they were like we're going into 3d we need to make three freaking forks coming out of the bottom of this thing <laughs> So uh, there were there were some mistakes made. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's I've actually I don't think I've ever held an original Nintendo 64 controller in my hands. Like, well, that's the life. That is that is a, that is pretty wild. I, I yeah. nobody ever used the left side of the controller, like the one with the part with the D pad. That wasn't I, when yeah. I was a kid playing N64. Not a single game did I ever touch the d-pad or or put wow. my hand in that grip i think the yoshi game uh used it but i never played that so uh <laughs> i guess i guess it's it was their way of like m easing the transition for developers but uh didn't really work quite right yeah. right right yeah i mean you know they kind of went back to it you know with like the wii classic controller and stuff like that they kind of standardized which was nice so i, I think the wii classic controller was uh I think they should have shipped that with every Wii U. Yeah. Or or, nice. or if they shipped it with every Wii, it might have. I mean, the Wii didn't really need any help, but uh, right. It, it it was a big problem for people who like third parties who were developing for the Wii. They everybody had standard control schemes, and then the Wii was like, "Here, you get a stick. Figure it out. <laughs> Map your friggin' right. get your game to work on this thing." And it, yeah. It, yeah, that's why third third party like Wii games were were not great or like wacky and weird and like they didn't put much effort into it. Yeah, and it's unfortunate because emulation on the Wii has always been kind of sucky. Unless you buy like a, a specific bar that works like with a Wii mote, like you're screwed. You can play Mario Kart and New Super Mario Brothers Wii and maybe Paper Mario, and that's like all you can play uh, when it comes to emulation. And so it's unfortunate because there's some good Wii games and it's just super hard to play them. So. Do any of these uh, emulators right now or portable devices right now run DS good yet? No, uh, I mean, the 351V is probably the closest you can get because it's got that four by three aspect ratio. So the DS games at least look good on there. But yeah, you know, you can imagine none of them are touch screen. And so you have that kind of uh, issue there. But then also flipping between the screens and stuff like that. It's kind of a pain. I mean, the the RGB 10 Max, like the one that I said is my favorite. This one has an advantage because it's 16 by nine. You can put both screens on at once horizontally, right? And so that makes it a little bit easier for playing a game where you need to see both at once. Um, but still yeah ds isn't there i think that until we get a touch screen you're not going to really be able to unlock a lot of these i forgot which device it was i i, I the, the rg351v does run ds pretty decent um but yeah. there was one of the devices that i tried that had ds but you couldn't click the screen it just wasn't an option in the software yeah. like you couldn't map the click button <laughs> so you could like i always try to boot up uh mario 64 the ds version and it, yeah. you just you there's a there's a mandatory touch here to start so you just you right. just can't yeah, can't it's just start. impossible <laughs> yeah that's a good point yeah honestly i think the best place to emulate ds honestly is like on an android phone because they mm -hmm. have that nice drastic emulator and it's got the touch screen enabled on the one side and that's probably the best bet what do you think about uh taking like a psp or a ds or i see you have a video on the vita uh and mm -hmm. and uh making those into emulation devices like hacking whatever portable system you have now yeah. uh do you think that that's a, a better option to buying one of these uh emulators or do you think it's uh comparable or do you think it's still worth it to spend a little extra money 
you know, it's hit or miss. Uh, I do the Vita, I do a lot of Vita stuff, and I really love it. You know, beautiful screen, great form factor, good battery and stuff. But it struggles to play like Mario uh, Mario World Two, like Yoshi's Island. Like it doesn't pass the Yoshi's wow. Island test. And so, yeah, in terms <laughs> it's of emulation, of it's not deal. great. But for right, <laughs> but for playing Vita games or PSP games, it plays them perfectly. PS One games too. Um, PSP, you know, it's it's okay. It plays PS One and PSP pretty well. But the emulators on those have never been all that great. Um, a, lot, a lot of people love them, but I, I just don't think they're all that good. Now, DS, I think there's a lot of potential there, especially like the 3DS, the 2DS XL and stuff. Those actually are really good with uh, emulation and stuff. But to be honest, I haven't made a single video about it because I'm a little worried about Nintendo coming after me. So I'm like, I'm not going to make a video about that one. It'll maybe make a written guide, you know, but I'm not going to make a video. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I agree. Like, I'm I'm not really afraid of making videos, but I'm not making guides. If you're making a guide right. on how to break a Nintendo, you know, device, yeah, that's not doing it. They they might come after you. Yeah, yeah I might be like, hey, sense. here are all the things. If you jailbroke it, like this is all the things you could do with it. Enjoy the video. <laughs> that I probably mean, would be. You could me. do that and 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 say, well, no, you can't. <laughs> I was gonna say you can link your yeah. guide, but then it's like, well, then you're just obviously pushing them somewhere else. I right. don't know about that. Um, yeah exactly but i get a lot of comments every time i make a portable emulation video uh on one of these devices i you, i either get why don't you just jailbreak a a, a vita or why don't you just yeah. uh why don't you get a psp or why don't you uh just plug in a playstation controller in your android phone right and it's like yeah. especially with the yeah. with the android phone situation it's like well i don't want to have a friggin dual shock 4 strapped to my android phone <laughs> it's right. like much more convenient yeah i'm the same way yeah, I don't like really phone gaming. I, I mess around with it and see what the potential is, but every time I go back to a dedicated device. And the Vita, you know, I, I may be downplaying it, but it is pretty awesome. It's just, you know, when it comes to emulation, they really underclock the CPU. And so uh, it's and it's on Sony's end. It's not anything that the community can figure out. And so because of that, it's, uh, it is really limited, but it can play very limited like Nintendo 64 and most Super Nintendo is just fine and stuff. Um, where it really shines is just being able to play, you know, PSP and Vita games and stuff. So what I always tell people who say stuff like that, like, like, uh, why would I get this when I can just have my Vita? Like, if you have a Vita, that's great. Jailbreak it. Do whatever you want with it. Like, that's then you don't need another device. That's totally fine. But if right. you don't have a Vita or a PSP or a DS to, to do that to, you still have to buy yeah. one of those. And those are, especially a Vita, they're like still pretty expensive right now. A yeah, Vita. Like 200 bucks. Yeah, last time I checked, the Vita was still up there, especially if yeah. you want the OLED screen. Yeah, it's amazing. It's like literally still at retail price. Yeah, uh, three hundred dollars renewed. Uh, the Wi-Fi edition. It's not even the freaking uh, yeah. the OLED. I don't think four hundred dollars right. for another one. Four hundred yeah. for the blue one. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's so crazy. here's a here's an opportunity for you to work on your Japanese skills. If you do like the <laughs> Yahoo auctions, which is really big in Japan, you can buy them from Japan and get them shipped, and you can get them for like 150 bucks that way. Uh, it, the, the X and A button will be like swapped, you know, like the circle and the X and stuff. But other than that, they'll be yeah, it'll be just fine. I didn't know the buttons were swapped. Yeah, like you can imagine, like you know, the A button to confirm as opposed to the X button right. to confirm in Japan. Uh, yeah, so on it, the it, software, like they're 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 swapped. Yes. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, just uh, yeah, software. Yeah, you got it. I typed in Yahoo auctions and it auto filled Japan. <laughs> See, yeah, that's like the most popular. Like that's their version of eBay and Amazon, basically. So, yeah. Interesting. Uh, I'll I'll will take a look at that. When I I went to Japan one time and uh, mm. I was in Akihabara, like looking around at mm. all retro stuff, and I had a list of some things that I wanted. And honestly, I it's like a tourist trap. So like they know that people yeah. like me are there to get like retro stuff. But uh, yeah, a lot of the prices were like the same as they would be if I just went on eBay and had them imported. So I was a little, a little disappointed about that. But I know, like, if I go yeah, like not... if I go like off the beaten path to like some retro stores, I might be able to find something that maybe is a, is a little better priced. Right. Yeah. I totally got to do with the locals too. Yeah. A hundred. Uh, I think a hundred dollars for a Vita on this on Yahoo auctions over here. If I, I'm sure Look the shipping's that. gonna be abysmal, but yeah. So That's there's companies good. who will like who will do it for you where they'll act as a middleman and so they'll compile all your stuff, they'll even buy it for you, right? And then you just oh. pay them for the shipping and the service and stuff like that. So I've yeah, heard of like the like... the shipping services, but I didn't know that there's companies that would buy the thing for me. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I'll have to look into that. Um 
what do you uh do you have any plans for future videos any any big projects you're working on that you're willing to talk about or anything more yeah. recent that year like your next video or something yeah so i have a controller collaboration coming out in a couple days and i i, I just got a couple other like kind of some of the smaller channels but a couple bigger ones too and i was like hey just what are your favorite controllers so i did my first like real collaboration video um and the big thing too is like showing my face now that's a new thing i was just showing my hands for the longest time so i'm working on all that stuff um yeah the mini pcs i think is like the next space i'm going to work on is being like hey pay 200 dollars for this thing and you can play every gamecube game like no problem other than rogue squadron which never works and so oh, that's, uh, that's i think gonna be the next best thing. one <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite it's game. It's so hard game. to emulate. <laughs> yeah, all those explosions, man. They're hard to like emulate. So. Damn. Does it just run slow or does it just not run at all? It runs fine until you shoot something. <laughs> like, <laughs> it slows down a bunch. So damn it. Yeah. I I actually didn't know that about GameCube emulation. Yeah, yeah, that's like the measuring stick. If it can play Rogue Squadron, it can play anything. So damn. Well, that's good. So, uh, thanks for being here. We we're almost at an hour already. That like blew by. Yeah, man, this is super fun. I really appreciate you having me on. This is awesome. Well, thank you for being here, everybody. Uh, you know now, Retro Game Court. You've probably, if you bought any of these devices, you probably stumbled across his YouTube channel. <laughs> so, <laughs> go. Sl I'm not subscribed on my personal account. I I fucked up everybody's gonna yell at me in the comments now it's my personal uh, channel uh, all right it's i'm logged into a, <laughs> my personal channel here anyway uh thanks for being here also your twitter's underneath you and uh i guess i guess we'll kick it over to to present day bob uh goodbye hi hello thank you past bob i hope you all that are here enjoyed that little talk with retro game core uh, I did. Oh, don't forget, you can check him out at youtube.com slash retro game corps. You know, like Marine Corps, Navy, Marine Corps. He was in the Navy. But Corps is like, is like, you know, like Marine Corps. Yeah. Or for you nerds out there, Contra Hardcore. It's <gasps> spelled like that because it's a pun. I did. So like know it's that. a hardcore Contra, but it's also like the Marine Corps. So, wow. There you go. You got to get on their level, Bob. I am on their level. I am a man of the people. You're so up here in your ivory tower <laughs> looking down on everybody with your 40 switches and your YouTube friends. <laughs> Tuck, thanks for the Prime subscription. Thanks for the good times, Wolf Bros. Thank you, Tuck. Uh, hi, Sea Monster. Sea Monster's here. Say hi, hi. to Sea Monster. I did. Okay. Uh... So yeah, that was that was our little talk with uh, with Retro Game Core. It was very good, very very insightful talk about uh, portable emulators with the man. Uh, also, I wanted to, I wanted to get into this topic right out of right out of the Retro Game Core topic. I wanted to get into the Ein Odin. This dropped this morning. Okay, so this news we saw a, a little bit ago. Uh, this is from Retro Dodo. Ein Odin handheld is the next gen quote budget handheld emulator, and uh, I forgot that I retweeted this and said, "Oh my god, it's a big! I can play Wind Waker on this Switch thing because it looks like a Switch Lite, and it's all these right. different colors." Um, I forgot about this. Uh, somebody DM'd me uh, the Indiegogo that they have. Where did I did I did I lose it? Uh, no, it's at the top of the keep. Uh, where's my? It keep? goes. It goes live tomorrow, Thursday. No, that's not tomorrow. Tomorrow's Wednesday. It goes live in two days on Thursday, at nine thirty p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So, so this is an Android-based uh portable emulator. Looks kind of vaguely like a Switch Lite. It's like rounded more. Um, and it could play up to GameCube stuff. This, uh, this Kickstarter is a little confusing. They emailed me. I don't know how they got my email, but I got an email from them also showing this, this preview of an Indiegogo. It's Indiegogo, not Kickstarter, but you know, Kickstarter is like Band-Aid. It's like a blanket term for all these yeah. stupid things. Um, so it's a little confusing. It's on, it's in Hong Kong pricing. 
So they have a the the they have three versions. They have a light, they have a base, and they have a pro. The light so so these are all Android based. So uh getting a more powerful one seems weird, but the light one doesn't have a Snapdragon processor. It has a Demenis Demensti Demenisti the city it processor. has a processor that you've never heard of before yes i don't i, I don't think i would get the light the base yeah. seems fine the pro is like way overkill but i might just get the pro because the pro is honestly not much more i think the pro is 300 dollars. Okay. um i'm gonna just double check on that uh 2000 hong kong yeah, I think that's like three. Two USD. It's two fifty. Two fifty six. Oh. Uh and the base is uh fifteen hundred. And that is two hundred dollars about. Uh so honestly, yeah, I think they're both fine. I, I wouldn't go with the base. I I mean I'm sorry, I wouldn't go with the light. The light seems like a little too light. Like I don't know yeah. if that will be capable of GameCube or if it'll run it good. Um, it's also weird because they have all of these, like they have The Witcher, they have Ghost Runner, they have uh, uh, Cyberpunk, but then it says game streaming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're not exactly playing these games on, on Android. Uh, it seems really cool. One thing that confused me was that when you see Ein, like that logo, it's A-Y-N, and it reminds me of the Aya which was that portable PC device. Uh, yes. Beat'em Up says a video on it. Uh, That's what, honestly, that was confusing me just now. Yes. So I was, I had the yeah. same sort of confusion when I, when I was looking at this before. So, uh, and if you scroll all the way to the bottom, it says there are risks with any project and we want to be upfront about the potential risks associated with this product. Currently, we have already dealt with the most significant challenges that could de delay our shipment. Due to the continuing impact of COVID-19 on shipping, there is the potential of slight delays of items in transit. We hope that by shipping with DHL, we will deliver all perks based on our timeline. Thank you. And their timeline is kind of ridiculous. The thing isn't hasn't even started its Indiegogo yet. They're claiming to ship the base and the pros in November and the light in December. That's kind of quick. That that says to me that has to say to me that everything is pretty much done, and this is just a glorified pre-order. Mm -hmm. Because if that's not the case, then we probably won't be seeing this for like two years. <laughs> the write-up that uh, Retro Dodo has is is looks promising i mean th there's a lot of information yeah. on it and uh i think is this taki udon i think taki udon actually got his hands on it he's playing genshin impact oh, wow. on it um so like like what retro game Corps was saying it seems like these guys uh did solicit feedback from uh from people and yeah. and tried to make it better this video when was this video this might have been a little bit ago yeah, since when since when is there no uh date on a YouTube video? <laughs> there it is. I just uh, think okay. this is from April twenty seventh, this video. Okay. So 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 that's when he did his little uh, his little preview. So it seems like they're they're pretty far along, but again, I thought this was Aya and it's not. And mm -hmm. looking at the company, this is all that they have. They're not a company <laughs> this is the only <laughs> thing that they have so um i i'm a little sus i'm gonna get yeah. it because i feel obligated to and it seems like they're trying to uh to directly compete with the steam deck because they're trying to get it right they're trying to get it out when the steam deck's out or a little bit before it yeah um, and you know the fact that they're prominently showing triple a modern triple a titles like the witcher and doom and red dead and games like that mm -hmm. that obviously can't run on this but possibly could due to game streaming that they have a development journey little timeline here and it says con concept conception phase hardware software and it started in 
March of last year. Yeah. Um, but you know, this is just a an infographic. Like they could have just yeah made this up. Uh, so I guess where are they at now? They're looking at mass production uh, in September or October. Yeah. So if all this previous stuff is true, that they already did the hardware and the software and the prototyping and whatnot, and mass production is supposed to start in September, October, that says to me, hopefully, that the Indiegogo is just a glorified pre-order mm-hmm. phase. Um, and once that gets fulfilled, if it's successful, they'll move on to do you know traditional production. I'm just concerned because I don't, I don't know if you've been following uh, the Intellivision Amico situation no, at all i could care less That's, about that i'll just i'll just try to sum it up it's another one of those they're trying to take like the atari vcs or the coleco chameleon where they're trying to take one of the old game systems and relaunch it for like a modern audience and whatnot um and it's just had a very bizarre and controversial crowdfunding and then it's been delayed several times and they're not being clear to their kickstarter backers or their investors to the full company what's going on and the guy who's running it who's actually a game musician tommy tellerico has just been not pleasant about any criticism towards it at all so it just if this has the potential to go down that route and just be a disaster in the making or uh just snake oil in disguise i, I remember this yeah yeah I, I remember this uh what did he work on what oh yeah what did he work on this guy uh he's he's done he's mostly done soundtracks he did the soundtrack for earthworm jim he uh he claims to have worked on metroid prime but he worked on the pre-production of metroid prime and they didn't use any of the work mm-hmm. that he did in the final product of metroid prime okay so there's that so he's just somehow got the license for in television and is just trying to roll with it yeah. he's, trying, he's trying to capitalize on the on the retro console like uh the market yeah. and i don't think he realizes that nobody cares about in television <laughs> yeah and like there's a lot more like weird crap that's going on that i'm i'm only like passively following all i know is that this has been a rock it's been a rocky uh development cycle and he has you know he has not been very kind to any criticism right uh towards the device <laughs> in terms of uh the ein governor squirrel in the chat says if they believe in it so much why don't they have a kickstarter i think he means why do they have a kickstarter <laughs> um which is a good question because it seems like they've already done everything they're like ready to go like that's that's another thing like a kickstarter to me especially when you have all of the pieces it's 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 to garner interest it's to see how many you're gonna need to make and they don't have enough time to add or subtract the amount that they need to make i don't I mean, well, it seems like they're saying that they're going to start production, mass production, in September or October. So I guess maybe they will have enough time. But like, how? Like, I, it, it seems way too quickly to change the scope of the project if you get like yeah. a lot of interest. I, um, I, I know, like a lot of Kickstarter's, especially for like gaming Kickstarter's, are glorified uh, pre-order. Mm-hmm. campaigns i i know bloodstained uh igarashi's game he only asked for like half a million dollars and he was very upfront and saying this is not the budget for the game this is just to prove that there is interest in the game right and because the kickstarter was very successful he was then able to get proper funding to develop the game it's also um, a sort of marketing ploy like I'm on Kickstarter, yeah. check us out. You have a platform all of a sudden. Yeah. Um so anyway, uh that pre-order for the Ein Odin goes up uh Thursday at 9 30 p.m. Eastern time. So I will be streaming probably at that time. I will need you guys here on Twitch to bother me around the time that's <laughs> gonna happen for me to stop everything and try to pre-order it. Um I'll try to get the bait. No, I I decided I'm getting the pro. I'm just going to get the pro. 
It's not that much. I'll just throw it all in there. Get the prop. I don't think this is going to be, I was going to get the, the base model or like the lowest one because, um, I don't see this being my new portable emulator. Like I don't see me wanting to play this thing, like carry it around with me, but yeah, who knows? And the, 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 the high tier one isn't that much more. So why not? What's the price? Uh, 250. Did we determine? I think we determined 250. I think so yeah. yeah, for for the for the most expensive one, and 200 for the base, and then the light is not worth it. Whatever the light is, don't yeah. bother. Um. Anyway, all right. So that's uh the Ein Odin. Mm-hmm. Last week, the indie world happened. Yes, of course it was the day after Wolf Den Podcast, so we couldn't talk about it on the of show. Of course. Um, but they had it. They had some good games. They had some interesting games. I, I thought it was a very good indie world. I said this was the best indie world I've seen in a while. Yeah. Uh, if there's more than like two games that you're interested in, it's a good indie world. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I think right off the bat, because the the first game they showed, uh, it got started off on the right foot. The first game they showed was Bomb Rush Cyberfunk. Sorry, yeah. I said that wrong. It's pronounced. Oh no, Bomb Rush Cyberfunk. They don't say it like that though. <laughs> no, but look at it. It's 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 Jet- very obvious. <laughs> it's Jack Ryan Radio. Uh, but. I'm pretty sure this is the like official spiritual successor to Jet Grind Radio. Official. Yeah. Well, how you know you what be, I mean. How like, can you it's, be an official it's, spiritual successor? <laughs> it's members of the original team yes. from Jet Grind Radio working on a new game in the same style because Sega isn't doing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's got uh, uh, our good friend uh, Hideki Naga Numa. Yeah, uh, who's a uh, great on Twitter. Uh, he's the one who did the soundtrack for uh, Jack Ryan Radio, uh, mm-hmm. which is the best part of Jack Ryan Radio. Uh, so yes. this this is going to be a good game. I'm I'm excited about this. Yeah, very much instant pre order, and it will be a uh, timed console exclusive on the Nintendo Switch when it launches in 2022. Um. I'm trying. I'm, I'm looking through Hideki Naganuma's tweets right now because uh, mm-hmm. he had he has good ones. Uh, it, oh, here- it's a lot of like. So why hasn't Sega made another Jack Ryan Radio? Uh, somebody tweeted him. Yeah, but do you like anime? But and it's like an anime girl with like big old boobs yeah. that I can't show right now, and he just goes no. <laughs> he quote tweets it and writes no. Uh. Sephiroth is weaker. It is super weaker than Super Mario. And then one of them is I'm interested in Michelle Obama. <laughs> um I like ladies with short hair. I like boyish girls. He's a very strange very strange person. Yeah. Uh Oh, how about this? I I had tweeted in only Japanese in the early years of Twitter. After that, English questions increased, and I started answering in English. Then foreign followers exceeded Japanese followers. I started to tweet in English mostly. Then you started sending me memes and slangs. The monster was created. (laughs) I'm liking that. Anyway, uh, probably the most important person on the uh, uh, Bomb Rush Cyberfunk team. Um. So that's the first game yeah. that they showed. That's the first bombshell. Yes. Oh, that's another one. Goku was my lover. Hideki Naganuma. This wasn't the second one they showed, but this was also very important. No. Axiom yes. Verge 2. Yes. Uh, prequel to the original Axiom Verge. A new hero fights for her life, empowered by the same microsonic, uh, microscopic, or whatever it is, yeah, microscopic machines that gradually consume her humanity with two interconnected worlds to explore and fight through. It's time to discover the origins of the Axiom Verge universe. It launches on Nintendo Switch now. So it is currently available. It launched uh, that night, I think. 
Yeah. Uh, which was, of course, a huge deal because uh, we knew this game was coming, but we didn't know when. And they were just like, oh, here it is. Yeah. This is developed by, by one guy. I'm not sure how much help he had from other people. Uh, and d- game development is not his full-time job. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the first Axiom Verge was a huge hit. Uh, and he didn't really care. He was like, <laughs> he's like, I'm going to keep doing yeah. my, my main gig and uh, I'll make yeah. this, I'll finish this game when I get to it. Uh, well, I think you need to leave the call and come back because you froze. Yeah. I, yeah, my whole computer like locked up and I was like, oh shit, I died. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll be right back. Um, anyway, uh, I should have streamed this the other day. I completely forgot that this came out. Uh, so I'll pick it up. I'll try it out one of these days. See, coming fall 2020. Oh, it got delayed. This is that this trailer is from 2019. It looks pretty finished though. All okay, right, what's, I'm back. what's next? Eastward. Uh, this one I saw that this was like supposed to be like a Game Boy Advance type game. Yes. Uh, discover a beautifully detailed post-apocalyptic world in Eastward. Eastward, an action adventure RPG with puzzle solving and dungeon elements. In a near future society on the brink of collapse, a hardworking miner named John calls a young girl named Sam in a secret underground facility. This unlikely pair will embark on an emotional journey to discover the truth, traveling across a wonderful, wonderfully weird world and exploring bustling towns, curious campsites, and shady forests. Uh, Eastward launches on the Nintendo Switch as a timed console exclusive September 16th pre-order uh, now. Okay, so that's pretty soon. Yeah. Do we know what type of game this is? Uh, it looks uh, action adventure RPG with puzzle solving and dungeon elements. Ah, so an action cool. RPG. Uh, I'm not sure why they slapped it as a Game Boy Advance game. I think that was Kotaku. Uh, yeah, I think I mean, it's just that it's like a it's like a top it's down a, RPG. Yeah. Well, that was really popular in the GBA era. Um, it does kind of have that feel, but it's like if the GBA was like four times as powerful. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Toem we've seen before. Yes. We've seen this, but this looks way different now. A laid back hand-drawn adventure game in which you set off on a delightful expedition and use your photographic eye to uncover the mysterious, the mysteries of the Aphonius, Aphonimus Toem Talking to quirky characters and solving their problems by snapping neat photos, you can make your way through a variety of different relaxing regions inspired by Scandinavian countryside. Uh, launches on Nintendo Switch this fall. Uh, I'm interested in uh, taking photos in a video game, but uh, yeah. I don't know how interested I am in turning that into an RPG. <laughs> Everything's in black and white, so I guess it's like film. It's like film. Yeah. It's supposed to give you like that film look. It looks pretty cool. It looks cute. Looks like a cute little game. Uh, it doesn't have a price, so I guess we'll check back in in what the fall. Yeah, which is soon. That's pretty soon. Mm-hmm. What else? We have Shovel Knight Pocket Dungeon. Pocket Dungeon. Finally, something from yes. Shovel Knight that's not yes. treasure trove. As presented by friend of the show, uh, Celia Schilling, Shovel Knight. Uh, pocket dungeon uh, with Puzzle Knight as your guide, fight foes, recover relics, and battle bosses, both new and familiar in this action packed puzzle adventure mashup. Group together enemies to unleash massive chain attacks and grab keys and potions and treasure as you try to escape the mysterious pocket dungeon. Over 10 heroes will be available, each with their own special powers and play style. You can even take on a friend head to head in local multiplayer. As an exclusive feature for the Nintendo Switch, Shovel Knight series Amiibo can be used to call on familiar fairy friend. Uh, it launches on the Nintendo Switch this winter. I was the 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 direct or the indie world like happened at like noon, and I had my laptop on my chest in bed like like this. Yeah, just like watching it, and then Celia gets on screen. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. I know her. I know that one. Yeah. I know that person. <laughs> We're we are we are that person's friend. <laughs> I played this game at PAX uh last year, I think. Um mm-hmm. and it is very chaotic. 
if you like right. puzzle games this is like uh like like you know it, it's like uh what bejeweled on acid it's like it's like yeah. a match three game but i think it's match five and uh you have to like keep a rhythm going and you have to chain things together or else you lose health. It's like, it's, it's, it's very hectic. I wish that they would uh, release a demo with it because I feel like you gotta, you gotta try it out and then like get hooked on it. Um, but if you're into puzzle yeah. games, I think that uh, this puts a really good spin on that type of formula. Yeah. Um, but this and is I most think it's cool that it has amiibo support for yes. the Shovel Knight amiibo this is most important because this is the f first time we're getting like a hard not even a hard this is the first time we're getting a release window for any new shovel knight game this yes. game has been <laughs> talked about for a long time and we're finally getting a window for it and it's winter 2021 we still have we don't know anything about shovel knight dig which feels a lot like a sequel yeah. to shovel knight but i'm not entirely sure what the deal is with that um anyway uh next uh oh yeah we're not done here uh yeah metal slug, uh, tactics. Metal slug tactics a fresh take on metal slug that moves the classic action franchise into a new dimension uh metal slug tactics retains fan favorite elements such as detailed pixel art and explosive action but adds tactical combat mechanics and roguelike elements to the mix Control familiar Metal Slug heroes such as Marco, Tarma, and Fio, and Eri in fast-paced dynamic battles. As a tactical game, positioning is key. Placing your troops correctly on the battlefield can activate the Sync skill, where multiple heroes deal extra damage to the enemy. Get ready for an all-new Metal Slug experience as it launches on the Nintendo Switch in 2022. This looks really cool. Uh, if you're interested in uh, like Advanced Wars and that sort of stuff, this is probably mm -hmm. like that on a crack. Um, so maybe give it a look. I'm not interested at yeah. all. Yeah, uh, and it, that's a shame because I really like Metal Slug, but I like classic Metal Slug, the run and gun, shoot everything in your way and just keep going. Mm -hmm. This is not that. <laughs> this is much more laid back and it's much more thinky it's much more strategic and i mm -hmm. i'm not about that life with metal slug yes so. uh next we have tetris effect connected uh yes. this game a lot tetris fans love this game and it looks yeah uh, it looks like uh like an acid trip i'm talking a lot about drugs yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh this version of the acclaimed tetris effect features the single player journey mode but also the competitive zone battle mode available locally or online and the cooperative connected mode also includes cross-platform multiplayer so it's easier to find people to play with or against uh it launches on the nintendo switch october 8th so um this game is already on game pass uh so you can play it on xbox it was part of like the xbox showcase um yes it's very pretty it's 40 dollars on its own hmm. i don't know if it has a price on nintendo switch but if you want it on a different system it's 40 dollars. so yeah uh oh here it is let's see if it has a price october 8th the day the oled switch comes out no price for the switch yet uh, but expect to pay like $40. That's pretty, it's a lot of money for friggin' Tetris. Also, another concern of mine, the, the game uh, window is so tiny on yeah. the screen. Like, like that's going to be a pain the in the screen. ass. That's going to be a pain in the ass in portable mode. Yeah, I'm like a little, a little like put off by that. But I mean, it is cool yeah. when you see all of the like if you're playing multiplayer and you see all the different screens. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but when you're playing single player, make the screen a little bigger. What's yeah. up with that? Or you know, give us the vertical option. That would be cool. That's possible. Maybe yeah. there is one. We don't know. Yeah. Um, and they have that with other games on the Switch. You can resize mm -hmm. it and zoom in. Game says Dolan. That's uh, why okay. don't they show that? That's like important. <laughs> so the tetris effect is that's the name of like uh it's an actual like phenomena yeah it, it where when you play tetris so much you start to see it in the real world you start to try to put things together yeah. and, and and shit um 
yeah i i, I this game's meant to be like really trippy uh um, yeah but whatever it, a lot a lot of tetris fans really like this so that's cool it being forty dollars i hope it's a little cheaper than that forty dollars is pretty crazy mm -hmm. what's next uh next is far changing tides Set sail for a new journey in this atmospheric vehicle adventure set in a post-apocalyptic universe first introduced in Far Lone Sails. Captain your own seafaring vessel and explore a vast flooded landscape, tackle mighty storms, and overcome conundrums while embarking on a voyage to find a new home. It's an emotional, meditative journey that doesn't require prior knowledge of the Far series. Uh, it will be available on Nintendo Switch early next year. Never heard of the Far series. Yeah, me neither. Uh, uh, this does look kind of cool, though. I'm it the visual aesthetic for it, uh, the idea of like exploring uh, the post-apocalyptic worlds on a boat sounds really cool. It looks very pretty. Yeah. Uh, I just got an email about a new Canon camera. Ooh. <laughs> XF six o five. It sounds like a point and shoot. Yeah. What is it? Uh, 4,500. It is like, yeah, it's like one up from your camera. Oh. Oh, oh, it's one of those. Okay. One of these, yes. Yeah. 4K. Yeah, if you're film... Oh. So if you're filming a documentary, get that. All right, next is Loop Hero. Yeah. Instead of playing as a hero in this innovative card-based RPG, you must craft the world that the hero travels through. Using the an expanded deck of mystical cards, place enemies, buildings, and terrain along each unique expedition loop that the hero explores. Powerful loot can be recovered and equipped for each class of hero, and the more loops you complete, the more your options expand with new cards, hero classes, and guardian bosses being unlocked along the way. Loop Hero launches for the Nintendo Switch this winter. I must so have drifted back of, to sleep during this part. So this game, basically, instead of controlling the character, you build the world around the character. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is very interesting in terms of gameplay mechanics. Like, do you make the enemies and stuff? Yeah, you place, like, you get cars and you place the enemies uh, in front of the character. That's similar to that game, uh, uh, Takahashi and, and, uh, uh, and Hiroshi or something. Mm -hmm. I, I, it was the game where, like, uh, there's two Japanese brothers and one of them's, like, sick and the other one has to develop a game right. for him to play. Um, oh, yeah. Anyway, uh, next is Boyfriend Dungeon. Uh, <laughs> people were playing the shit out of this game last week. Yeah, it's it's available now. Uh, in this heartfelt dungeon crawling dating sim, use uh, use the in game cash you earn from fighting monsters to woo your weapons from on romantic outings. Multiple combat styles just means more cuties to forge relationships with. <laughs> uh, date your yeah, weapons, basically. Uh, I saw somewhere like people were sending one of the one of the voice actors like nasty comments and death threats and shit because they didn't like what his character does in the game. Friendly reminder: don't do that. <laughs> uh, I hear it's really short. Yeah, maybe I'll try it if it's really that go. short. I think it's only like five hours. Um, oh yeah. They... Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah. So it's like a dating sim slash uh, RPG where all of your loot is uh, a boyfriend for you to date. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very strange. Uh, but yeah, it's out now, yeah. so you can try it out. Uh, and I hear it's pretty good. Uh, Necro Barista Final Pour. In a story about coffee and death, this anime-style visual novel follows a dynamic cast of characters as they navigate a fantasy Melbourne's a navi as they navigate a fantasy Melbourne's coffee culture. Okay, that makes sense. The questionable ethics of necromancy Ooh, those are nice and the process machines. of letting go. 
This expanded director's cut of the original game features a new story content and remastered visuals. There's even a new studio mode where players can create their own dialogue and stories. Uh, Necro Barista Final Pour launches as a time console exclusive now. It's currently available on the Switch. Uh, don't make me play this just because it has coffee in it, okay? I don't, I don't see did a you, single coffee right now. I saw some espresso that machines. Other, did you play that other coffee visual novel game, Coffee no. Talk? No, I did not. Did you play the demo? I played the demo, yeah. That game was was like predominantly visual novel and like maybe 10% making coffee. Interesting. But the coffee gameplay mechanics, as it were, it was like kind of difficult because you got to get it right. You got to actually try to like draw the little leaf and shit on the foam. And that's actually very hard to do with joysticks. So I don't know if this is any better or not. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, Islanders Console Edition. This is, I think it's, yeah, it's published by Coat Sync. They did, um, yeah, they published uh, uh, <laughs> Fogs. That's the game. Oh, yeah, yeah. In, in this relaxing, procedurally generated strategy game that is not about the team who should have won the Stanley Cup last year, fucking Tampa Bay, I <laughs> uh, see you developing an island by placing buildings from your inventory, score enough points that you will get more buildings uh, with which to keep growing your island settlement. Then when you can't build any further, just start from scratch and do it all over again on a different island. Uh, with its minimalist approach, intuitive mechanics, and most and almost infinite colorful islands to build upon, uh, Islanders lets you create the city of your dreams over and over again in no time at all. Uh, and it is now available on the Switch as a Times console exclusive. Okay. Uh, and the last one we have here is Garden Story, which uh, we, we saw. I made this. I don't remember if this was in. Uh, an indie world or if this was in that one of those uh, what do you call it, like a wholesome directs yeah uh, become a guardian of the grove and explore vibrant island to inspire its inhabitants fend off the invasive rot and rebuild your home take on the requests from villagers solve puzzles and do everything you can to help restore the community it is a time console exclusive and it is available now this one had a much more interesting description than last time we read about it yeah it had it said some some weird words <laughs> uh combat in the invasive rot yeah anyway uh it looks pretty cool looks uh, like a looks like yeah. a zoldor type situation but it's got yeah. little cute animals or a little cute uh vegetables that you play as yeah also shown in the direct as more of like in the montage uh, Slime Rancher Portable Edition uh, cu and Curious Expedition 2. Both of those are available now. And also shown off was 100 Days Winemaking Simulator, Gang Beasts, uh, Astroneer, and Lumberjack. Uh, cultivate Fruity Friendships. That was the line from the Garden Story uh, uh, yeah. uh, synopsis from last time. So overall, of all of those games, Axiom Verge is a huge deal. Uh, Axiom uh, Verge is a huge deal. Pocket Dungeon Shovel Knight is a big deal. Bomb Rush mm -hmm. Cyber Funk is a big deal. Even though we already knew Absolutely. that was coming out, we just got like a minute yeah. more of footage. Um, yeah. Those were what I was very excited about. Tetris yes. Effect is kind of uh, cool, uh, but yeah. I don't know if I'm going to get it because if it's freaking $40. I will also say that um, I I like the look of Gang Beast. I think that's a could be a very fun game. Did you see that? Gang Beast sold like eleven million copies already. Really? It's a, yeah. It's it's already incredibly popular. I think in wow. I think in Japan, um, it's used on a game show. Okay, but it uh, looks like it. It looks like a Japanese game show. I I only know, it, but I, I think it's an American made game. I I, yeah. uh, I only know it from like you know like achievement hunters played it, you know, like game grumps have played it, and like you know it's it's been a YouTube thing for a while. Um, Gang Beast is on Game Pass. Oh, okay. Well, play it on Game Pass then. Well, I don't have Game Pass. <laughs> the hell's wrong with you? 
I, I play my games differently from everybody else. <laughs> well, Gang B seems like one of those things where uh, you need some friends. Mm. Doesn't seem like something you want to play by yourself. That's a problem. I hate playing games with my friends. <laughs> uh, Gang Beast released in like 2015 originally, didn't it? Yeah, something like that. It, it's been out yeah. for a while. It's just now it's coming to the Switch. Yeah, so now I care about it. Anyway, Sleeping Toads TV, thank you for the four months. Hi, Wolf Team. Hello. Hello. So that is the uh, indie world and the best one we've had in a while. Yes. Let's plow through some more news before it gets too late. Yes. Uh, uh, we have the Switch in the in the first console. The Switch is the first console to sweep Japan's game sales chart in 33 years. Top 30. Every game in the top 30 of August. Yes. Oh, August 8th, the weekly top 30. Every single game was a Nintendo Switch game. That's insane. <laughs> in Japan. So it's so a Famitsu's yeah. top 30 sales chart. Yeah. Uh, Nintendo has controlled the Japanese games chart with multiple platforms before in the early 1990s. The Famicom, Super Famicom, a.k.a. Super NES, and Game Boy uh, cemented its position. It's much harder for a single system to rule the rankings, though. Uh, there's also a sharp contrast with the U.S. While the Switch has outsold rival consoles in the country, the frequently and frequently thrives in game sales, Skyward Sword HD was July's best-selling game. It typically faces stiffer competition from the PlayStation and Xbox ecosystems. There wasn't a direct explanation for the sweep, although the titles reflect both the Nintendo's influence and the local tastes. Most of the games are either Nintendo's, including Skyward Sword and Mario Kart 8, or come from franchises that have long been popular in Japan, such as Monster Hunter, Taiko no Tatsujin, and uh, Dragon Quest... It also helps that Japan is in the grips of its largest ever COVID-19 pandemic wave. People may be buying Switch games to keep them from and their kids entertained at home. Uh, whatever the reason, the feat suggests that why Nintendo isn't in a rush to upgrade the Switch beyond modest re uh, revisions. Its hybrid console is still one of the hottest game systems four years after launch, even in the face of technically superior alternatives. Um, so the last time they did this was in the Super Famicom era. And uh that's because uh it was either the Super Famicom. No, the the Famicom era, nineteen eighty eight. Oh. That's that's earlier. Oh, oh the, the article says that they also did it in the Super Famicom era, but it was different it was the Famicom, Super Famicom, and the Game Boy. So, oh, okay. uh, this is the last time they did it with one console was 1988 in the NES era. Okay. And that makes sense because there was zero competition when the NES was out. The g gaming was, uh, was on the decline. It was down in the dumps and the, and the well, NES scooped it back up. Well, not necessarily. It was different in Japan. Uh, cause gaming never really collapsed, but having said that, the the Famicom was a phenomena, and the only other competition that was there was the Master System, and the Master System was really only successful in uh, Europe and Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean there were other systems, but they were not they were not anywhere yeah. near the the juggernaut that the NES was at the time. Um, and right now, I mean, the Switch has competition. It's just, it's yeah. a very bizarre. I, th I think they just, the game sales are just insane on the Switch. There's always a lot of Switch games on top sales charts, even in America. But it's very yeah. strange that not a single other game is up there, like GTA. Like GTA is always up there. Why is that? I'm trying to, I'm trying to find what the, f it, it won't let you go past 30 this list. And mm -hmm. I want to see where the first non-Switch game is. <laughs> you know, because like it's probably thirty-one. It's, yeah, number thirty is Mario Maker Two. Excuse me. <laughs> there must have been a sale or something. Yeah. 
Human Fall Flat. I think that's the, like a single player version of Gang Beast. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. But just also like to add that Breath of the Wild is 21. Oh my Still, God. Mario Kart 8 is 4. Still, how old is Mario Kart 8 at this point? Minecraft is number one. What is this True. one? Uh, I could read this, um, but it would take me 14 years. Uh, my Google Translate is... Kudeyo, did I do the right one? Yeah, Kudeyo Shin Chan. Oh, Crayon Shin Chan. Crayon Shin Chan. <laughs> that what? Aura a, and the Aura and the Doctor Summer Vacation, a seven day trip that doesn't end. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah, Ring Fit. Ring Fit's a big deal in Japan. Yeah. Game, uh, Game Maker Garage is up there. Damn. Oh, wow. Freaking wait. Hold up. Uh, uh, 51 Worldwide Classics, whatever that game, uh, Classic Games, Classic <laughs> Game, or whatever the hell it's called. That's up there. That's yeah, weird. yeah. Japan's weird. That's funny. All right. Well, anyway, uh, that's a surprise. The Switch is selling a shit ton in, uh, in yeah. Japan. It's doing great. Who would have thought? Uh, next, we have Sakurai isn't thrilled about being a meme. That's sad, because uh, too bad, yeah, bitch. <laughs> uh, during the most recent ha uh, Hardara's Bar episode, which you can watch at the bottom of this post, uh, Tekken designer Katsushiro Hadara asked Sa Sakurai his views on the never asks me for ever anything ever again meme that features the veteran game creator's face. While Hadara once wore a shirt <laughs> saying, don't ask me for shit, spawning a meme of his own, Sakurai never actually said the more frequently used quote. Like internet memes, this phrase is often on your picture, Hadara said, arguing the context of his shirt has been lost and how the inaccurate quote is treated as something he said. Uh, I feel like, Sakura continued, I want them to stop using my face or my icon to say what they want to say, even if it's a joke. You shouldn't use other people's power for your own principles, he added. What? On Sakurai's Twitter profile, it states that he doesn't take questions. If you, if you make the bio sound really strong, I guess it could be interpreted like that, he noted. He, he, he definitely is just misinterpreting it. It's like it's clearly yeah. a joke, and, and yeah, and even if people do think that he actually said this, so what? No one, you yeah. know, the context. Maybe it was uh, someone was being an asshole, and he had to put he had to put his foot down. You know? Yeah. Also, uh, also in keep in mind that this man is like sixty years old. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he 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 looks like like a child, uh, but yeah. he is old. He is he predates memes, so yeah. Uh, in some ways, the Sakurai meme is akin to the anime was a mistake meme, which features a quote misattributed to Hayao Miyazaki that many now think is real. Over time, the jokey quality of the meme quotes uh, can be lost, and those words might become etched into stone as fact, which can be frustrating if it's your face attached to something you've never said. Sakurai is 51, I want to clarify. Yeah. He was born in 1970. I mean, I get what he's saying. He does, you know, he doesn't want to be, because he didn't. If, if he didn't say that, he doesn't want to be attributed to something he didn't say. Um, having said that, Hayao Miyazaki definitely seems like the type of guy who would say <laughs> anime was a mistake. He uh, is such a grumpy Gus. I want. I see a lot of the memes of him on on Twitter that are from like the documentaries from the Ghibli movies. Yeah, uh, I've never seen one of those. Doc I saw like a ten minute one on YouTube, but I've never. I've never even seen a Ghibli movie. Me neither. But I, I've and, always and wanted to see one of the uh, one of the documentaries because he seems like yeah. it seems like a shit show trying to finish one of those animes. And I and I know he's in particular Miyazaki is very like old school and like cantankerous and just just hates so much. It's the best I can describe it. He hates so many things. Because he's 80 years old and he doesn't have time for this shit. Right. But. 
Next. And, and in, for a while, he hated his son, but they're okay now. <laughs> oh, God. Next. Scuff uh, is making new a controller. Scuff controllers. Make it two controllers for the two? Xbox. Yes. I didn't know it was two. Uh, well, they're making one, and they're making a pro version of it. Scuff has introduced two pricey controllers, a $170 Instinct and the $200 Instinct Pro. They're made for Xbox, and to that end, they oh, feel like Microsoft's here's, official here's controller the other one. and fit and finish. Here's the other one. I found yeah. it. Yeah, so there's basically... They're basically uh, third-party Elite controllers because Microsoft has not made a series edition elite controller yet so scuff is doing it uh so these controllers are expensive yes oh i think kevin katz has a video on this i didn't realize that that's what it was um yeah he got to try one out that's pretty cool uh yeah. they i mean they look beautiful the damascus one looks beautiful um scuff has been making controllers for like a lot of like professionals and 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 twitch streamers and stuff uh, for a long time and they've always been expensive they really just put back paddles in them uh but yeah. uh they i don't think they've ever made an xbox controller at least they, they have in a while no i think they did but what's particular about this is according to scuff they're using the same board as microsoft the same circuit board mm -hmm. that means that scuff's new controllers will use microsoft's dynamic latency input to control lag and they will also get all of the firmware updates and improvements as official xbox controllers these are the first wireless controllers made by a third party that were designed to work seamlessly with xbox series s and x and they'll also work on xbox one pc um and ios and android and other platforms via bluetooth so these cost more than an elite controller which yes you gotta prove to me why i'm paying more than a friggin elite controller i like the fact that this is specifically for xbox series consoles mm -hmm. but i don't like uh how it's more than a than an elite controller i just wish microsoft uh, would make a new elite well controller. another thing you can do is like these are customizable so you pick your own faceplate and and things like that. Can I pick this one? Uh, Instinct series controllers are far from being a copy of the default controller. Uh, the Instinct Pro has switches located beneath each trigger that can be that can vastly shorten their travel distance when Ooh. activated down to 0.2 millimeters, making it feel like you're just clicking a mouse. The Instinct Pro also has rubber grips around the back that offer far more grab than your average controller. I like the, I, I like having really short triggers. Yeah. Also, I'm interested in, uh, if the buttons are uh, membrane or if they're like uh, like a tactile click. Because uh, yeah, one of my favorite controllers was the Razer Anza. That was uh, back when the Xbox 360 days, and that had tactile clicks under the buttons, and that was really freaking cool. Um, but anyway, yeah. Uh, hmm. Where does it say the price? Uh, two hundred dollar Instinct top. Pro. Oh, it says yeah. it on top. Let's have the article. It said it. So one hundred seventy Instinct and two hundred Instinct Pro. That's not a yeah. big price disparity. I wonder what. The only the only difference is the Pro has the rubberized grip and the hair trigger switch. Uh, the hair That's trigger it. switch seems pretty important. Yeah. This what that Otherwise, says to me is that they really wanted to get under the price point of an elite controller and they couldn't. Yeah. So they they <laughs> made, made two versions. Otherwise, they're the same. They have they come with swappable faceplates, thumbsticks, uh, multiple thumbsticks, um, anti friction rings around around the thumbsticks, a D pad that gives you that gives your controller a custom look and feel. Each controller ships with one faceplate. Replacements start at $25 and go up from there, depending on design. Four thumbsticks, two rectangular concave sticks that match the color palette of your Instinct model, as well as one tall black dome stick and one short dome stick, and a hybrid eight-way D-pad, much like the one on Microsoft's latest controller. The D-pad can be replaced with a cross-shape option for 10 bucks. Extra thumbsticks come in two packs for 10 bucks or four packs for 15 bucks. Uh, the, the Instinct controllers ship with a six and a half foot USB A to USB C cable for wire play, and they will sell a twelve foot cable 
for 20 bucks. That's one up on an actual Xbox controller. It comes with a fucking cable. Yeah. Um, what else do I want to say? Oh, uh, the anti-friction ring is actually pretty cool. I, I have that on yeah. the Power A like Fusion controller, and it's it's uh, it's it's very slippery. It's pretty it's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, being able to, uh, also, like, rotate like that. You can remove the rumble feature for four dollars. So if you want a lighter controller, you can do that. Does it cost more to remove it, or do you save four dollars? It says you can opt to remove its vibration motors in the grips for three ninety nine. So that implies to me you have to pay to take out a feature. <laughs> Very strange. I, yeah. I don't want a light controller because you know you you're gonna yeah. throw the thing around. Yeah, I mean some people I know do like light controllers because they prefer, you know. It feels better in their hands than something the, like super heavy. Do those people are those people known to throw a controller through the TV? Uh, I don't know. Is there a correlation? Is there an overlap between those types of people? I don't know. All right, next GTA remaster is uh, coming, baby. It's real. It's happening. What's happening? All right. Do you want me to just summarize this? Because summarize uh, it. Yeah, because I, I heard right, about so this, but we already knew about it. I don't know why this like blew up last we week. We knew because I think like. Because Kotaku got basically confirmation from sources within Rockstar that they're going to remaster uh, Grand Theft Auto 3, Vice City, and San Andreas, the PlayStation 2 era GTA games. Um, this And they're going to release this fall for all modern platforms, including the Nintendo Switch. Uh, rumors only grew in popularity as Rockstar's parent company, Take-Two Interactive, used DMCA takedowns to remove classic GTA mods from the internet while announcing that the publisher had three remasters in development. This is uh, this is a part of like a bigger push to get other uh, games from that era remastered and put out on modern consoles and also just other Rockstar games remastered and re-released as well. Mm -hmm. uh, all, all three of these GTA games are being remastered using Unreal Engine and will be a mix of new and old graphics. One source who claims to be have seen a snippet of the game in action said that the visuals reminded them of a heavily modded version of a classic GTA game. The UI for these games are being updated too, but will retain the classic style. No details were shared about gameplay, uh, but Kotaku has been told that these remastered titles are trying to stay true to PS2 era GTA games as much as possible. Okay. Uh, any idea when we're getting this? No details shared about gameplay, uh, but Kotaku has been told these remastered titles are trying to stay true to the PS2 era. You literally I thought just said just, that. Yeah. I thought I saw someone saying this fall. Okay. Well, yeah. People have been wondering about when we're going to get GTA 5 on the Switch. Well, baby yeah. steps, you know? I've been wondering that, yeah. Maybe well, they're I, just testing to see what's what could happen. I don't know, because GTA 5 has sold more copies than anything on the planet. And I don't think it would hurt them. It's not going to hurt them financially to put GTA 5 on the Switch. Right. And I'm pretty sure GTA 5 can handle it. I mean, the Switch can handle GTA 5. This... A PlayStation 3 their... game. I gotta I gotta clarify that GTA 5 yeah. is a PlayStation 3 game. <laughs> yeah. Them re-releasing their older games and putting it because they're not just putting it on the Switch. They're putting it on PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Series X, PC, Stadia, and apparently mobile phones, which have had those games for a long time already. But that seems to be much more of like a greater push to uh revamp and like re redistribute the classic catalog of rockstar games uh to a new audience because you know admittedly those games are kind of hard to play and get your hands on right now i think you can play them on pc and i think uh, most of them are backwards compatible uh, oh no i think only san andreas is backwards compatible on xbox one and series x not the not vice city or gta 3 the hell so yeah so i, I understand why they would want to you know, remaster these games and get them back out there. Um, I just, I don't understand why 
GTA 5 is not on the Switch. That's just what I don't understand. John Got the Juice says the Switch weaker than the base PS4. That's why people question if it can run uh, Wolf Den, Bob. Yeah, it's a PlayStation 3 game. Yeah, it came, It was. It ran on the 360 fine. I think it had like four discs, but it ran. Um. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, so uh, expect this trilogy sometime or at least yeah. to be announced sometime soon and I hope it does ha- at least have gameplay mecha- like updated gameplay mechanics because those games don't age well mm-hmm. like if you fail a mission there's no checkpoints in the mission you have to start the whole thing over again and by that I mean you have to get in your car drive to the mission start the mission and then proceed on from the beginning uh we're gonna read this real quick this is call of duty vanguard reveal event seemingly coming this week via war zone i saw there was a there was a teaser trailer for it It looks like a world war ii game uh this is call of duty's next game probably coming out in november or some bullshit um and i I guess they're gonna reveal it in war zone thursday yeah okay oh thursday yes Multiple social media users have reported that the PlayStation Store has begun to show advertisements for the reveal, which say an event will take place at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, The adverts specify that the reveal will take place within free-to-play Battle Royale Call of Duty Warzone. So wait until until 2 p.m. Eastern and watch it on YouTube. Um, The PlayStation Store adverts aren't replicable by all users and it isn't yet clear whether it is purposely mysterious teaser or a mistaken early release uh i see it here in this tweet it uh looks like a little tile that just says like when it's gonna happen uh and i kind of believe it it's it, it we got a teaser trailer already uh it, yeah. i thought it was a terrible teaser it was like just like scenes of war and then they like pan out and you'd see like a vague face like in the dust or in like yeah it, it was it was weird uh and like faces that are like unrecognizable like why do we care about these characters yet anyway um yeah i don't know how i feel about it i mean it's call of duty uh yeah, I'm yeah still, it's just another call of duty i'm still playing warzone so i guess having an event in warzone is kind of cool but uh people are off of warzone right now because it's riddled with cheaters and everybody hates activision and i don't blame yes them. uh it's like i like to just remind everybody that activision blizzard is currently facing serious ongoing allegations and in fact a lawsuit involved uh regarding harassment and mistreatment of many of its employees especially marginalized workers um please be aware of that and use that to your judgment as to whether or not you want to support that company yes last uh we talked about it last week didn't we might have been two weeks ago. Yeah, we talked about it on the, on the show already. We, go, we go talked back about it. Yeah. Go back a few podcasts if you want to hear more about that. Yeah. Um, last thing I wanted to talk about, I slapped this in real quick uh, because I saw people yes. on Twitter talking about it. Uh, Among Us devs aren't feeling Fortnite's new imposters mode. So Fortnite has a yes. new mode that is basically an Among Us ripoff. Um, yes. I don't know why this is a big deal because uh, Call of Duty did this two weeks ago, I think. They did the exact same thing. They made their own Among Us mode. Um, and also, isn't that just a ripoff of Gary's mod, like the Trouble in Terrorist Town? Like that was I already think, a thing. So I think the big deal is that A, Among Us is currently like the uh the big uh werewolf style game or mafia style game that there is where there's like a a hidden traitor amongst your ranks and you have to like figure out who it is um before they take over or whatnot so any any game that's going to copy that style is inherently going to be accused of copying among us much like how any game that's putting in a battle royale mode is going to be uh accused of copying fortnite or pubg I think yeah. the bigger deal, I think the bigger deal though is that in a lot of epics uh, marketing and, you know, announcements about in th- this mode, they they just use terminology from Among Us and don't even bother to change it for right. the for the game. So, so, I think so th- that what? appears to be the bigger issue especially with the developers of 
among us. So, so what I what I saw on Twitter is similar to what I see in the chat from Metacenter, who says Fortnite's entire game was built on a ripoff of PUBG and other battle royale games. PUBG mm-hmm. was a ripoff of H one H one Z one, which was a ripoff of Daisy. So yes. so <laughs> that's not original either. And uh, so this is the tweet that I saw. Uh, uh, it was. Uh, Victoria Tran, who works with uh, uh, on Among Us, I think that it's a she's like a community manager. She's or something. their community director. Yeah, it would have been really cool, really cool to collab. Uh, like game mechanics, fine. Those shouldn't be gatekeep gate kept, but at the very least, even themes or terminology makes things more interesting. Uh, so, like, basically, she's saying what you just said. Uh, yeah, change the ch- like, come yeah. up with your own shit. Do do something unique Mm -hmm. to the game don't just make the entire don't just make among us in the unreal engine yeah so i i agree there i agree that they should have at least made their own terminology that's probably why call of duty didn't get much crap for making their own among us mode however Mm -hmm. everyone needs to calm down like uh even this article says uh Among Us wasn't the first game of its kind. It's basically a reworked version of the party game Mafia, also known as Werewolf, and like Secret Hitler, and all of those card games. Uh, And Among Us wasn't the first game to be like that. Uh, So Among Us just really got lucky. But the problem here is that Fortnite is ripping off terminology from the game. Uh, Yeah. It's really just that uh, it's 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 a it's a it's an indie game like Among Us is an indie game and it's a good come up in story like it it's a very small game that all of a sudden had yeah. like a huge success and was outselling all these AAA stuff and that's great and it's good for them, um, but uh, yeah you have big bad Epic stealing ideas from them. Uh, well, because it's it, yeah, you know, go it, ahead. like all f- all art all media is basically a rework of something else. And, and it, it's it, what makes something good is how a creator is able to put a unique spin on the subject or the topic or, you know, the gameplay and whatnot. And it just, it lo- doesn't look like Epic is necessarily doing that. They're, they're just making among us in the unreal engine. They, they add guns and stuff, but I don't think that's enough to differentiate it from the most popular version of this type of game is what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's basically like you said, Among Us was an up and coming story. You know, a small indie team making the biggest game in the world, and now here comes the other biggest game in the world with a much bigger team and all the money, and basically saying, "Oh, yeah, here here's our big ass corporate version of it." Well, that's how they got so popular. Was that they? We're making their game, and then they shoehorned in a battle royale version right at the last minute. And yeah, battle royale seems to do good. Yeah. I'm trying to see when Trouble in Terrorist Town became a Gary's Mod thing. Uh, yeah, uh, but I can't seem to find like a date. But it's been around for a really long time, and it's the same formula. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, they should have used their own technology, but I mean, I, they should have used their own terminology, but. I don't think that's enough to to make a whole stink about. I think that it, it these are all just generic game types that have been around for a really long time. It, it'd be like if uh, it, it'd be like if freaking uh, Call of Duty was mad that Splitgate has team based multiplayer. Like it's not like it's it's just, well, just that's just a game type. Yeah. But I mean, like like Gears of War had horde mode like they basically created horde mode mm-hmm. but then like uh halo came around and they had their own version of horde mode and i forgot the name of it i think it's firefight but they put their own unique spin on the same type of gameplay you know going back a ways you know there was doom and then star wars dark forces is essentially a doom clone but they did other things like they they added jumping which was a big deal they put a bigger emphasis on story they had star wars sound effects and music in it you know they did all these things to make it you know different and unique enough to differentiate it from the original well, well, well the different and unique thing here is that it's in fortnite <laughs> but it's like 3d and, could, and shit you know you can shoot yeah each other. and you can and you can play as superman which is it's <laughs> don't play as superman in 
Fortnite because it's just, it's just really weird to see him snipe people. I, I, I'd just like to end this by saying I don't like Fortnite. I think it's not a good game. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I don't want to act like I'm over here defending Fortnite. I think that, you know, yeah. it's just not good. I, I, I haven't had a good experience in Fortnite ever. Um, and I like there's other battle royales that are way better. Uh, but I don't I, I think that uh, everybody just ha hates the popular kid, you know? Yeah. Anyway, uh, that's it. Or we plowed yes. through the news. Uh, but All we right. still have more to do. Like, for yeah. example, uh, we still have... Quit of the week! Quit of the week! Quit of the week! Now, this is... Oop, peep, oop. This is from the real uh, A. -R -A Ronk. I don't know. Uh, it is two pictures. It is of uh, a cool futuristic looking Taco Bell that has like a drive through under it and it's got purple lights. And then the second picture is from freaking uh, uh, Blade Runner, the new one. And he's all bloody and he's got purple light on him like he's looking up at the Taco Bell. <laughs> so whenever I test my... Uh... My Blu-ray player, my 4K Blu-ray player, I use that scene from Blade Runner oh. 2049 because I like the way the colors pop and it's an excuse to see uh, Anna de Armas nude. Um, so I, I like have this scene memorized and I'm just picturing him staring at Taco Bell and Taco Bell saying back to him, you look lonely. You're such a good Joe. And he's just like staring there getting mad that he, like his whole life is a lie <laughs> at Taco Bell. <laughs> I, I haven't I only seen that movie once and it is one of my favorite yeah. movies. I need to watch it again. It is like I, like it is a very good movie. Mm -hmm. Such a good movie. I will I will let you borrow of, of my Blu-ray next time I see you. I have it. I have the. I think you ripped it for me. I ripped the first one for you. I don't know if I ripped the second. I acquired the second one somehow. Okay. Uh, but yes, you definitely ripped the first one for me. The first one is yeah. not good. I'm sorry. The first one is not as boring and slow. That That's whole movie could be I... five minutes. Oh, so the the second one, which is like twice the length, is okay. Yeah, it's beautiful and sad, and 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 every second I was staring at it, it was awesome. I, I think the problem is because you saw Blade Runner much later in yes. life, and by the time Absolutely. you saw Blade Runner. You have also seen like forty other things that ripped off Blade Runner. Yes, it's like I when I it's like when I first saw Night uh, Night of the Living Dead. I thought it was boring because I've seen so many other zombie movies that came after it that did the same thing but better. Yeah, it's like playing Ocarina of Time when you're thirty one. All right, anyway, uh, let's. Uh, oh, you have an unboxing. Do that real quick. Yes. And while you do uh, that, I I'll read. Uh, I'll read from last week's Wolf Den Life. Okay, so there was no note, but uh, according to the label, it comes from Eva from Vancouver, Washington. I think it's Trevel. I think it's from Trevel, but... Uh... Okay, so it's... They came with straws. Or it's Trevel's Doom girlfriend metal or something. Plastic. Oh, God. Isn't that... Isn't, aren't, aren't metal ones, like... Uh, it, is it that dangerous? Don't people say you can, like, no, uh, no. like stab yourself in the head? Oh, yeah, if you don't know how to use a straw. Uh, also, plastic dinosaurs. And... Oh, I gotta make you bigger. Hold sticker... On. Plastic dinosaurs. And stickers featuring what looks like Audrey from Little Shop of Horrors and Audrey 2, the plant. You gotta hold it by you. The camera's out of focus. Right. <laughs> You're not doing anything. There, cool. There you go. How's that? That's okay. gonna be beautiful. Yeah, all right. Let's see here. All right. While you do that, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm reading some right. some stuff here. Okay. Oh, here it is. Okay. Maybe I'm not. Oh, well, it's like an actual mug. Yes. That is very nice. So there are two boxes like this. So this is the one, and then there's another one. It's a taller one. Oh. Let's see what's in here. Now that's gonna be like a thermos. Yeah. Uh, yeah, awesome. that's a thermos. 
All right, it's the same stuff. Very cool. Yeah, very cool. It is hand wash only. Good to know. Yes. Uh, Travels in the chat. He he confirms that it is his girlfriend who did that. Nice. Your girlfriend makes good shit, my friend. Uh, I am tempted to watch this tonight so I can roll into work tomorrow and be like, hey, <laughs> look at my stuff. Feel like such an ass about it. Do it. Um, very cool. Thank you so much. If you want uh, to check out Eva's stuff, you can check her out on Instagram at Eva Constructive. Thank you for your support. Thank you for yours. Uh, there it is. Very cool. Yeah. Uh you do ceramic uh mugs? We might have to talk. We might have to talk. Yeah. Um anyway. I only nope. get our dad off your back about merch. <laughs> Last week's Wolf Den Live, we got the script flip network who says Crystal was Game Boy Color exclusive. We got there eventually. Uh although my <laughs> friend cut the notch out on the top of it. It would work on his ancient Game Boy. Hold on, there's a bug on my screen. I gotta kill it. Uh, he would went. also walk around caves without Flash TM by turning up the audio and listening to bump sounds when he ran into walls. What a guy. That seems really strange that it would work in a normal Game Boy. That seems not right. Yeah. I mean, that says to me that it, like, because Gold and Silver work in a normal Game Boy. So that says to me that Crystal is basically the same game, uh, even down to the system of run on, but they really did not want you to be playing on an old Game Boy. They yeah. demanded you upgrade it. I mean, it was the new cool hotness and, and the yeah. Pokemon company had to try to conform. Night Owl Chemi says, obligatory comment to help Wolf Boy algorithm. See, that's a good, that's a good man right there. That's a good fan, yeah. Uh, EPS 5000, is that the robot from Sonic Adventure? No. Damn it, what the hell is that robot's name? Anyway, you put a gear, a game gear at C, color backlit screen, and the Game Boy at B, much worse screen that you can't even see. Are you insane? Uh, no. It has better games. That's it. It doesn't matter how great the hardware is. If the games aren't there, it's not fun. That's you just basically did the ads that Game Gear used to run against the Game Boy, where it'd <laughs> yeah. always be like it was, it was like it was Ethan Suppley before he became famous, like playing a Game Boy, mad that you know it wasn't in color, so he smacks himself in the head with a dead squirrel to see color. And the, the voiceover guy would go, there's an easier way to get color. Get a Game Gear. <laughs> so don't listen to ads. <laughs> Eddie Yoshi says, the PSP was only good as a media player, question mark? That's like saying the DS was only good for Picto chat. No, it's not. <laughs> and saying the Vita had, had a better library than the PSP? That may be the worst take you guys have ever done, XD. The Vita as a console was better than the PSP, but the PSP's library couldn't be topped. I beg to differ. <laughs> the Monster Hunter series, the Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker, and Portable Ops. Portable Ops, get that out of your mouth right now. Uh, the Apparently Wipeout Ops series. Good. GTA Sto uh, Stories series, which was on the DS, wasn't it? Yes, uh, yes too. Some of the best versions of the Tekken and Soul Calibur out there and uh, the ability of PlayStation 1 backwards compatibility so you can play any PlayStation 1 game you ever uh, wanted. Yeah, but you could do that on uh, the Vita too. <laughs> yeah. So we didn't say that the PSP was only good as a media player. What I said was... I think that was possible. I, only... I think we possibly said that. <laughs> well, what I said or what I meant to say was I'd only ever seen people use it as a media player right everyone i had ever seen use a psp was using it either to listen to music or watch movies on it i rarely if ever saw somebody actually play peace walker portable ops wipeout gta uh tekken soul Calibur, anything any actual video game on the psp P peace walker came out at the tail end of the psp's life cycle i played mm -hmm. that on the vita <laughs> yeah so uh also, 
the Vita also had backwards compatibility with PS1 games. Not yeah. all, not all of them, and I don't think the PSP had compatibility with all of them either. But it had them. The the so. Vita, the Vita had better, had more games that spoke to us. The PSP, yes. we weren't interested in any of those games. The Vita had more of the indie stuff that we were all over. Uh, Clockworth Clone says you can watch Shrek on the PSP, but can you watch Tenet? Probably, but no one's made a video on it. Uh, speaking of which, you saw the tweet today that the Dune person, that the guy who's directing Dune, is yeah. all pissed off that people aren't going to be watching Denny, on the big Denny screen. Denny Villeneuve, the director of Blade Runner twenty forty nine, he basically pulled uh, Christopher <laughs> Nolan and is saying the same bullshit. He, he's much more angry uh, that Dune is not going to theaters. Like he he's very much mad that HBO is putting it on HBO Max at the same time. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to bust out the old uh, the old SP. And I, you know I hate to say it to you, dude, but this is probably like, if it wasn't a pandemic, I probably wouldn't be able to see Dune on the big screen. You know, so this is the way I'm going to be able to see it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So. I have an idea on how good. To, I have an idea on how to get a movie in, in worse quality than, a, than a, an SP, but I don't know. <laughs> I, that might take a really long time and I don't know what's going to happen. Uh. Anyway. Die Goliga, thank you for the prime and Tyler PM. Thank you for the 14 months. Now let's get into the chat real quick because we, yes. we're very late and we got to leave. Yes. Um, uh, where are we? Oh, your wishes. Thank you for the two months. Just joined RG351M. What about it? Did you just get one? It's a great console. Yes. Spoopy Girl with 400 bits says, Bob, great interview. You guys had a great rapport. Will loved the then slash now pick on Twitter of you and Bob on the red Jeep. Yep. I'll pull that up. Uh, there we are. So, for context, for those of you who don't know, uh, we had a Power Wheels red Jeep from when we were kids, and my our father was trying to fix it up for my daughter, but we couldn't get it working. But while we had it, uh, our father was like, "Hey, recreate this picture of the two of you." So we tried. We did we ever do that with the actual Jeep? I don't think we did. No, no, we never did. We had a uh, red Jeep. We had, we had an actual red Jeep Wrangler. Um, and no, we never were able to recreate it. I wanted to recreate that picture and try to get the same outfits we were wearing. Uh, your so. wish just says, and yeah, I just got the RG351M. I've been doing programming for it. That's freaking awesome. You should check yeah. out uh, Retro Game Core. <laughs> Mega Dragon said with 10 bits, hey, Will, I probably asked this question to you before a while ago, but I kind of feel like asking this again. What's your take on physical versus digital comics? You probably have a whole uh, video on it. Probably from like the dark ages. Um, honestly, I have no, like I've been reading more digital comics um, for two reasons. One, it's just easier to get than just go out to find a comic book store and get monthly comics. And also two for space because they don't take up as much space as physical comics do. Uh, that said, I don't have a problem with physical comics. I still buy them occasionally. Um, there is something to be said for reading a physical comic versus reading something on a screen. Um, but you can teach yourself to read digital comics and read them in a way that you, know, you absorb the material and you enjoy the whole process. I will recommend... Though, if you're going to read digital comics, read them on a tablet. Don't read them on your computer. A television screen. I don't understand why, you know, DC Universe has a television option. In like 2012 or 11, I had a desk job and I just read comics on my Mac all day. Like on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> Edward Bova, Xbox boss Phil Spencer has managed to get his hands on Steam Deck early and says that streaming Xbox games such as Halo feel good on the handheld, according to an IGN article. How do you think uh, he was playing the Steam Deck? Do you think he sideloaded Windows and used PC Game Pass, or do you, or did Ask Cloud directly through sh uh, Steam? I think he did the uh, Xbox he... Game Cloud through Steam. Yeah, or he probably pulled up a browser and did it that way. Because that thing's got to have a web browser on it. True. Uh, there, when when Steam showed off this, Valve showed off the Steam Deck to the to the press. 
they were they were very like particular about what you could and couldn't do with it like certain games or apps you can load to it and whatnot so they probably didn't let bill spencer put windows on it that having said that obviously he wanted to try game pass so he probably loaded up the browser that's on there and tried it that way True, yeah. I don't know which version of uh, Game Pass or cloud streaming that they would have been using. Yeah. Um, but I'd imagine it'd be very easy to get xCloud on the Steam Deck if, if, if you really need it to be on there. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's available through Steam currently, but uh, I'd imagine they'd support it yeah. with, with no problem. Microsoft seems totally cool to play ball. Yeah. Uh, Tristan Snyder, Will, did you ever get your iPad fixed? Nope. Still waiting for my friend to borrow his heat gun. Try to melt the glue that way. <laughs> Use a blow dryer. Let's get real close. It's not It's not as hot. Yeah, just get close. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yo, Power Wheels have a weight limit of 60 pounds, boys. I'm called the police. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what we weigh. Yeah. I probably missed it. What are your appreciation of a Pi Boy using Pi Zero in a G Pi case? I think I have a video on it. That sounds like a very think, difficult thing to do. I think I, I think I have a video on it, and I hate, I hate Raspberry Pis. <laughs> yeah, I have a video on it on the G Pi case. That's an old video. Um, but yeah, I don't like raspberry Pis. it's that whole setup is expensive and shittier it plays games much worse than just uh, buying a portable emulator so yeah. uh yeah it's not i i say it's not worth it well have you seen star wars visions trailer i will answer that i have uh, it looks fucking sick yeah i can't wait to introduce my wife to anime <laughs> that might get me interested in star wars again <laughs> i thought you I, were interested again since when i i Man mandalorian okay yes that yes that did it yes you're right you're right and when they do the obi-wan show i will definitely watch that yeah uh book of boba fett i think is the next series didn't they like delay October. it or cancel it or something no no it's still coming out oh will you be announcing the wolf den game boy on twitter uh i taught i teased this in the my stream uh yesterday uh if you're interested in getting your hands on one of these, whoop, whoop, I ruined everything. If you're interested in getting your hands on one of these, it's going to be expensive. Just letting you know right now. It's going to be incredibly limited. Make sure you have the notifications turned on for the main Wolf Den YouTube channel. It will be in the next video. God damn it. I'm hitting all the wrong buttons. So, turn on notifications for the main YouTube channel, youtube.com slash wolfdead. And the second you get a notification, go right to the description and click the link. And, uh, it'll again, it'll be very limited and relatively expensive because it's a, it's a custom Game Boy. Um, but anyway, thank you guys for hanging out. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching us. Thank you for chatting with us. As always, the Wolf Den Podcast is every single Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern right here on twitch.tv slash wolfden if you can't make the show for any reason at all we oh always God. put it up as an archive version over on our youtube channel youtube.com slash wolfden podcast so you can go and check us out over there on demand whenever you want if you prefer to listen to us rather than watch us you can do that as well we're also on audio podcast on anchor.fm slash wolfden podcast and your preferred podcast service of choice no matter where you get this show from Please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review us because that helps us with placement on all of those respective platforms. Yes, I will most likely be live tomorrow. Uh, probably got to keep playing Ocarina of Time, baby. Uh, I'm actually enjoying myself a little bit, Will. Believe it or not, that oh, game wow. pretty good when you know where you're going. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, guys... Say hello to Wood. I don't know what the fuck he's playing. Road 96. I've never seen this game before in my life. Oh, I've heard of that game. I forgot what it's about, though. Uh, thank you for being here. This is a long one. Uh, don't forget to check out Retro Game Core on YouTube. And to turn on notifications for the main Wolf Den channel. I'll see you later.
Bye. Bye.